Hello, 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 welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm just adjusting some things. Woo. Hello, don't know what happened then. I pressed the button. Oh. Hello everyone, it's Fox from Model Making Guru here. Hello, 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 welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you can see and hear me okay. Welcome to a, uh, another impromptu Gumpla Times video uh, where I am working on, in this case, the big master grade Sazabi Verkar, Ver Shanghai Dragons, Ver Borderlands for my patron George. It's a Patreon reward build. <laughs> and while I'm doing the um, uh, the boring dry brushing bit that's going to take me forever, I'm just hanging out with you guys. I just, while I'm here, may as well have some company while I'm doing it. Now, my glasses are filthy. I just realised this. I need to quickly clean my glasses. So hopefully you're all well. Won't be a long show today. Uh, I'd started a bit late, so I've only got a couple of hours really. It's what, quarter to four. So we'll go till about dinner time, till about six. I was hoping to get started a lot earlier today, uh, but I haven't had a chance. So uh, this was the earliest I could start. I was like, oh... I was hoping to start around about lunchtime, but never mind, never mind, I'm here now. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, this is just the typical kind of stream that I do all the time. I'll be doing some work. <laughs> yeah, I'll be trying to do some work. Uh, and uh, keeping you, uh, keep, or talk, hang on, wow, hang on, start again. Water this week, I'm afraid, today, not coffee. I've had too much coffee already. I'm already a bit hyper. Uh, yes, I'll be doing some bits and bobs while hanging out with you guys. Basically... The point of the stream is, as you've seen in the other ones, it's just I'm doing some stuff that's quite boring if I just sit here and do it on my own. So I'm hanging out with you guys. You guys can keep me company while I'm doing it. Uh, now, this is George's Patreon reward Sazabi build. Uh, if you remember, it's for those of you who haven't seen this before, it's a master grade Sazabi Vukar. It's going to be painted up uh, in the livery and along the theme of the Shanghai Dragons Championship Overwatch team, the pro Overwatch team, um, who were rubbish and were good, decided to give it a terrible battered beaten paint job and then they became not rubbish. So it's still getting a battered and beaten paint job. Because George, my patron, uh, who I'm building this for, uh, he loves the uh, Shanghai Dragons. That's his favourite team. He's got the cap, he's got the hoodie, he's got the bits, he's got the tchotchke, he's got the key rings, he's got the mug, he's got the underwear probably. He's got the, I don't know, all kinds of bits and bobs, the wiggling hula girl for his dashboard that's in Shanghai Dragons colours. So it's going to be painted in the Shanghai Dragons colours, which is reds and yellows. And I still haven't sorted out a picture so you can look at it on the screen while I'm talking, but never mind. Uh, it's going to be in those colours, but also um, it's going to be painted in their colours and livery, but in the style of Borderlands. We've kind of decided, because I've done some testing uh, on a different build, and I th it's going to have that kind of Borderlands look. So it's going to have the sort of painted with watercolours but outlined in ink comic book style. It's not cell shading, it's not quite the accurate phrase for it. It's with comic book style. So where are we up to at the minute? Well at the minute uh, I am in the dry brushing stage. We've got the armour is going to be red and yellow for the most part. Uh, we have uh, base colour, the reds and the yellows, and I'm in the process of dry brushing the yellows. Uh, so all the yellow parts, this is a double red and yellow part, but all the yellow parts are being dry brushed. They've been base coated in Avalanche Sunset Citadel paint colour. They've had a shade of Agrax Urshade, another Citadel paint. Uh, then I've dry brushed over again with the Avalanche Sunset. Avalanche Sunset. Or as that bloke from, Game, from Warhammer TV calls it, Avalanche Sunset. No. No, Avalanche Sunset. I don't care that you work for Mohammed. Avalanche Sunset. Uh, and then we're going over now with a dry brush of Uriel Yellow. The point I'm doing at the minute, the whole thing I'm doing at the minute, is basically we're dry brushing, we're post shading. Uh, I didn't do any airbrush pre shading on this, we're post shading. So we're getting a pre shade effect, but by dry brushing after the fact. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we're working through the yellow, yellow, which is the second. There'll be another coat of dry brushing after this. But we're trying to get the pre-shaded look, as well as a kind of rough watercolour painted look. It doesn't have to be neat and tidy. It's going to be battered and beaten. But there you go. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, I'll quickly have a look at chat and see who's in. I'm going to rush through things a bit because we've only got a couple of hours. So I don't want to be like going on too much and not doing too much work. As always, uh, something refreshed on my screen there. I hope you're all still there. As always, this is one of our typical streams, so you're hanging out in chat, you're hanging out with me. Uh, if you want to catch my attention, my iPad is right in front of me here, just off screen, so I can see the chat. Uh, you can do swearing in chat if you want. We're all grown-ups. Uh, is it me or is the camera just very slightly wonky? Hang on, let me put the other glasses on. It's probably not perfectly straight. I do 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 do
<laughs> yeah, I can I can imagine the OCD and me will get annoyed by that. Yeah, the lines don't go straight. They never do. Although it's just a, the problem is it's just easy to move the cutting mat because uh, there you go. I've ruined it now. <laughs> Uh, so yes, if you, um, I've got the chat here. So if you want to get my attention, uh, please do. Just put your comment in big fat capital letters. Uh, if you want to really get my attention, you can do a super chat, which is the dollar symbol uh, at the bottom of the chat window. That puts your comment in a big colour box. Uh, you can't, I can't possibly miss it. Also pops a little animation up here with the sound and everything else. So I have no way to miss your comment. Um, oh, uh, but yes, if you've not got access to chat at all, the chat is here. If you're not, if you're watching this. But if you want to join the live chat, you need to watch on YouTube. So hit the YouTube icon that's down here in the bottom right hand corner of the, of the video player somewhere. Hit the YouTube icon. That will take you to the YouTube page where you can join in the typey typey live chat. Uh, don't forget, of course, we've also got our stream boss battle ongoing. Current stream boss is Cy Reynolds, uh, our very good friend. I'm going to turn the volume on the microphone down a little bit. There we go. Uh, Cy Reynolds, not, it says model making guru, but that's because I pressed the wrong button. I do apologise. Cy Reynolds is the current stream boss. The whole point of the stream boss battle is that you guys have to get him down to zero health. Uh, if you get him down to zero health, you win a big pot of money to buy uh, whatever you want from Games Workshop, Forge World, or Goblin Gaming. And I went because it's part of my Warhammer Sunday uh, show, but I just I let it flow on to the rest of the week. Basically, every time you do a super chat, uh, or every time you do a tip through the tip jar, which is streamlabs.com forward slash model making guru, you take a bit of Simon's health off. The more you put through as a, a tip or a super chat, the more health you take off. So if you put a pound through, you take a bit of health, you put 10 pounds through, you put a lot more health. Um, and basically all that money raised through tips and super chats goes into a big pot. And if you get him to zero, you win that pot. Uh, when Simon became stream boss, he won 500 quid to spend at Games Workshop, Warhammer, uh, Forge World, or if you're in the EK, U, EU or the UK, f uh, game. Uh, pff, wow, hello, start, hang on, wait, words. Games Workshop, Forge World, or if you're in the EU or the UK, Goblin Gaming. Uh, just before we get going though, on that note, very, very quick shout out to my channel supporters. First of all, all my patrons who support me financially. I love you. You are awesome. They keep me going. They keep this channel going. I depend on my Patreon supporters uh, for my income. This is what I do for a job. So thank you very, very much for my Patreon supporters. This is a Patreon exclusive build, this Cesarbi. So although we're streaming these um, sort of, you know, doing things, live streams open to everybody, the actual video build series where I'm going through all the steps and saying what I'm doing and teaching how to do it, that is a Patreon exclusive series. You need to be a $10 plus patron to watch that. So if you're wanting to watch the full build series, I'm in the process of filming episode four now, uh, make sure you go and support me on the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash model making group. Uh, this channel is also supported by emodels.co.uk, your one-stop shop for all your traditional model making needs. Uh, your tools, your kits, planes, cars, trucks, tanks, aircraft, war stuff, not war stuff, anything you need, even Gumpler, they even sell Gumpler. Uh -huh. uh, go to eModels, the UK's largest stockist of Tamiya. Uh, they stock pretty much every other paint range and all the kind of tools and equipment you need. So go and check them out. The link is in the description below this video, emodels.co.uk. And of course, I'm also supported by Goblin Gaming. Uh, again, the link is in the description below the video. Now, the link down there is my affiliate link. Basically, if you need to order any tabletop stuff, and that's anything from Warhammer, Malifaux, Conflict 47, Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, any card, tabletop card games, any tabletop games, anything like that, including paints and tools and things as well to make the stuff for your game tabletop hobby go to goblin gaming uh, use the link in the description below this video that's my affiliate link if you go there you'll save yourself up to 20 percent rr of rrp from games workshop conflict 47 and malifaux and massive savings on everything else and you'll also help support this channel a bit because i make a little bit of income every time you use that link down there so if you if you're into tabletop gaming or even just the models the warhammer and stuff or stuff like that go and check them out use that link down there store that in your favorites and every time you order from them it's 20 percent cheaper for a lot of that stuff and you help this channel out so let's crack on uh, I will have a quick look at the chat very, very quickly. Stevie and Junior Outdoors says, thanks for my stickers that arrived recently. You're at my pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, might not get to any stickers today because it takes 20 minutes to do that. And I want to kind of rush through quickly if I can. I've only got a couple of hours to work today. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I need to get as much done as I can. Uh, Pascal was first in earlier on. He says, hi, he was actually first in earlier on. Welcome, Pascal. Uh, Pascal, Retro Rabbit Studios, loafing screen. Woohoo. I think he means loading screen. But welcome, welcome, uh, Rabbit. Uh, average Modeler. I can hear banging downstairs. I'm not sure what Mama Fox is doing. Um, Average Modeler says, hello, uh, thy creator. Hi, Fox, just stopping by. Can't join today's stream. Okay, well, sorry you can't join us, but well, thank you for popping in. Hello, hello. Phil Lewis and Quano Man both say hello. Uh, who else have we got? Patient X. 
Uh, oh, uh, Average Modeler says, I'm digging this streaming while I'm at work. I don't have to listen to old people radio. And Patient X says, can't be a bit of old people radio. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Phil Lewis says, quick, Fox, put some old people radio on. I was hoping to start earlier, like 12 o'clock my time, lunchtime my time. In which case, you would have had like six hours of me streaming to keep you interested while you're doing your job. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, somebody mentioned, uh, Quantum Man mentioned, says, wow, cool tunnel. And, patient, and uh, Retro Rabbit says, reminds me of the original Xbox background screen. That's kind of what I was going for with that background. It's off the shelf. I didn't make it myself, but it's off the shelf. But yeah, it's a quite a nice background. It's amazing. It's like a quite a nice tunnel. It's quite hypnotizing. But you never know what travels through such tunnels, do you? Uh, Quantum Man says, I think this is Fox's way of hypnotizing us to send him fudge. That's the mellow music. Yeah, you should always send me fudge anyway. You should always send me fudge. If there's an option to send me fudge or not send me fudge, you should just send me fudge. Uh, I'm joking. Let's have a look. Uh, Chris from Ghost Models is one of your mods. He's in today. Welcome, Chris. He's at work, but I'm sure he's just quickly watching between between things to do and customers. Uh, Eon's car is in. I will play Skyrim, but waiting to finish both Fallout 4 and Witcher 3, bouncing between them, because there was a, one of the tunes in the preamble sounds a bit like the Skyrim background music when you're wandering around chasing mammoths and stuff. So, yeah, because like I said, I must play Skyrim again. Uh, let's have a look. Underdog Painting is in. Welcome, Underdog. All right, matey. Uh, are we going to learn about the changes in our bodies in this BBC edutainment program? Uh, says Rhett, says Rabbit about the the countdown clock. That's ITV. That one. The uh, the programs for schools and colleges are actually ITV, not BBC. You see. Ah. Uh, Elon's car says, "I swear that E-Models theme thingy sounds a bit like the music from the old Doctor Who shows. It does come from somewhere. I'm not going to say where, but it does come from somewhere." Uh, the first person that figures out where it's from will win a sticker. But yeah, it is from somewhere. It is vintage. And I'm hoping it's fine to use. Uh, let's have a look. I'm triggering everybody by having the lines not quite straight. Good. Uh, Lynn Dipple says, Heidi, I'm off today. So you're stuck with me today. Hi, Lynn. Nice to have you around. Uh, I'm only going for a couple of hours, but you, but uh, welcome, welcome. I'm at work for another hour, then off to the Warhammer shop, says Chris at Gross Models. Ha! I can't remember where you said it came from. Don't tell anybody. You can't answer, Chris. You know where I've told you where it came from. Right, so that's the chat up to date. I still have another swig of the waters. Yes, I'm on the waters today, not the coffees, because uh, I've had lots of coffee today. And I'm already a bit, little bit hyper, so <laughs> I need to calm down. So, yes, we've got lots and lots and lots and lots of armour to do. Uh, like I've said before, I'm going to be doing this for days and days and days. And I've, I keep... My intention is to just sit and do these streams each day, uh, although everything keeps happening around me and I get not channeled. Like I was going to do it yesterday, I didn't get time to do it because other things in real life kicks in. So, oh. so you got me for a couple of hours today. Tomorrow I am at eModels, eModels.co.uk, your one-stop shop for all your model making needs. Uh, I'm with those guys. I've got to pop down and drop off some some bills that I've done for them. Uh, Chris, I was in gross models in the chat, and Ted, Skipper Ted, if you watch us on the Monday night show, they'll be there as well. Uh, we're going to get there for about lunchtime. I know Ted might get there about 11, I get back there about, about 11 or so, 12. I would say if you're going to come down and say hello, probably do it from about 12 o'clock, 11 or 12 o'clock. Um, Tony as well is going to be coming, I think. Hopefully Tony, who you've seen do some builds, but you've you only ever seen him very, very briefly on one or two of the live, show, uh, live shows, unfortunately, because he doesn't often have time. So. <sighs> Daniel Smith says, Hi all, have I missed much? Been building a shed to make into a little workshop. Finally, no more airbrushing in the kitchen. Uh, no, you've not missed anything. I'm just starting now. Uh, one thing I will though say though, is if you're doing that, if you're building a shed into a workshop, that's awesome. Just make sure you put as many spider deflection systems in there as you can. Like little fluffy strips on the bottom of doors and things. Because that would drive me nuts. I'd be like, oh, I'd love a shed and just do it up into a little workroom. But I know the potential for spiders, and that's not an awesome potential that I want to be involved in. So, yes. So, yes, we're doing dry brushing again today. Uh, like I said, this was Avalanche Sunset with a Agrax Earth Shade shade to darken it down because we're doing post-shading dry brushing, not pre-shaded airbrushing. Uh, now that's done, we're doing a dry brush of Uriel Yellow, the, the paint that I can't pronounce because I hate this name, Uriel Yellow. It's a layer paint, and this is the second highlight. So whereas the first dry brush was of Avalanche Sunset to bring back the lighter areas and just leave the darker shaded parts in the recesses, this is now to bring back the more centralised areas of the highlight area to bring it back even brighter. Uh, but this is on a smaller area, so we're focusing more towards the middle of panels and areas away from the shadows. 
Uh, we did a load of these last time we were on because it's quicker than the first dry brush coat which was doing the whole thing. This is just little central areas and it's just brightening it up again. Now it does look a little bit patchy, you won't really see on the camera there, but it does look a little bit patchy, a little bit scruffy, but that's exactly what I'm after. Exactly what I'm after. Because this is going to be a borderland style paint job, which means it needs, before all the ink goes on and little outlines and cross hatching and things like that and paint chipping, it needs to look scruffy. It needs to look scruffily painted because if you look at anything in Warhammer, in Warhammer, in Borderlands, that's too much. Uh, everything is kind of scruffy and patchy and it has that kind of, that's too small that brush, it has that kind of painted with watercolours look to it. I can hear music from downstairs, that's weird. Mum Fox must be watching something with the volume up. Um, oh, it's I can hear Midsummer Murders. <sighs> For some reason the theme tune from Midsummer Murders, Murders triggers me incessantly. It's the use of a theremin or a fake theremin. It's just horrible, I hate it. But I think she's actually doing the washing up as we speak, because I can hear dishes moving around. Um, so what was I talking about? I've got no idea. What was I in the middle of talking about? No idea. I've forgotten already. Oh yeah, so yeah, if you look at anything like vehicles or scenery or anything like that, it looks kind of splobby. I can't really explain it. Like not blotchy, but not smooth. And the whole point is it has that kind of watercolour and inks look to it. Uh, you know, you've got transparent paint colours going over over each other and giving patchy effects. That's the kind of look I'm going for. Now, when you, if you've ever drawn comic book art, like in the old school way, which is pencil outline, colour it with watercolours, and then go over with your inks, either brush or nib, uh, you'll know that when you do that first round of watercolours before you've done the ink, so it's just pencil outlines and then the watercolour colouring, you'll know it looks terrible you'll you'll color in the page but of course you won't be careful about straight edges and stuff because you know there's gonna be ink going over the top of it and you've got areas of black to ink in and cross hatching and stuff so that first basic watercolor coat where the, you put the colors down looks like absolute biblical ass it always does always does it's only when you get the ink on top the outlines and the shading and cross hatching and the black areas that it suddenly pops and everything makes sense so as you're watching this uh you might notice it looks a little bit rough and ready around the edges and if this wasn't going to be a, a borderland style paint job i'd be like oh i need to do a lot more work there that's a bit rubbish that is and i forgot to put a glove on as well um but yes it will look terrible until the ink goes on because the ink will make it all come together. And I'm, I'm, I'm so used to that because I used to draw comic book art and stuff. I used to do that kind of artwork. So I know exactly to expect that kind of this looks terrible phase before it suddenly gels with the ink. So I'm not worried if it looks a bit patchy. You might not see it on camera. Wow, Fox's huge hands got huge. I put them on the big screen and I got scared, lol. Yes. You know what they say about big hands? They need big gloves. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm putting the gloves on because I've, I said that in the last stream these are acrylic paints, and the, although they're not as bad as I'm by MIG paints, acrylic paints unvarnished are very very delicate. You can't afford to go scratching and scrabbling; you will scratch them. Now it doesn't really matter too much because I'm going to do a lot of chipping and weathering on this thing, but I want to keep the accidental chipping to a minimum. I'd rather paint the chipping on than have actual chipping. Do, 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 do. Because if I scrape the paint off too much, whereas if it was, say, a grey plastic model, it would look like a paint chip, especially if I'm going to paint the paint chips grey. On this one, if I scrape the paint off, it's going to be red because the plastic underneath the primer is red. And the last thing I want is a bright red paint chip. That wouldn't really, uh, wouldn't really work. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, dad, dad, he didn't use a dad device, says Gross Models. Uh, yeah, I do have a dad device for the paints, for the paintings. But there's no point doing it when I'm dry brushing because I'm constantly opening and closing the pot. And if I did that, I'd have to be constantly farting about. This is for when you have the pot open all the time. Just shut up. <laughs> uh, anyway, Dad's not watching, so ha. Uh, right, so yeah, we're just dry brushing today. I'll go for a smaller brush again. Smaller brush. 
I'm brushing with the smaller brush. Uh, Athol McNichol is in. Hi, Athol. Welcome, welcome. She says about my hands being huge. And Athol says, wait till you see his ginger beard. And she says, I haven't. It really scared me. I ran away. So here we go. So we've got these flat panels here. What's that you seeing on screen? That's a bit bright. Got these flat panels here. Again, we're just going to focus in the middle of panels to get this highlight. The whole point of this is um, it's a long, drawn out, conv convoluted way of doing a, a pre shaded effect, but it's actually post shading because I'm doing it after I've done everything else. Because I didn't use airbrushes on this, I only used airbrush to get the base Avalon Sunset down because um, GW don't do rattle cans of the Avalon Sunset. Whereas the red armor has been sprayed on with uh, Mephiston Red Rattle Can. So. I'm get my train of thought there. Uh, yes, I don't want to do. I want a very specific borderlandsy look to this. So airbrushing it would have probably saved some time, but uh, it wouldn't look right. It it would look too neat and tidy. For example, if I just air, if I'd say pre shaded it, so I'd done like a, a light colour primer and then a black or dark black dark grey pre shade lines here and there and then airbrushed over say the Avalon sunset and then airbrushed over some of this you can airbrush with this at Del paints but it would have looked like an airbrush job and i'll be honest it's not the effect i'm after because i want this i can't find something to attach this to now because i want specifically this borderlands look um the the brushed dry brushed effect is exactly kind of what I'm looking for. Like I said, that kind of off, that kind of watercolour and ink effect. I want it to look a bit higgledy piggledy and ramshackle. Because once you've got the chipping and everything else over this, it's gonna be fine. And I'm thinking more Borderlands 2 era style artwork than Borderlands. Borderlands 1 was maybe a bit less that, Borderlands 2 was a bit more refined. Borderlands 3, from what I've seen, is a it's a bit more fussy. I'm thinking more Borderlands 2 era. So I'm just focusing on the middle of panels and I'm going in little circles because I'll, if there's two ways of dry brushing, you can either do the flicky flicky, which is to pick out edges. We can do little circular motions, which is to build up a color smoothly. And I don't mean like, I don't mean like no texture. I mean to remove any hint of brush marks because you're going over and over the same area repeatedly. It just gives you that kind of smooth effect. Uh, where is Gross Models located, says Athol. And Lynn Dipple says, somewhere near London, he's at work now. Yeah, Chris is Dan Saf. He's a Londoner. He's not actually in London, he's in... I can't remember where he is now, I forgot where he is. Uh, but yeah, he's Dan Saf, is our Chris. He's a Savannah. Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? Yeah. That's why whenever we do a live stream together, I always ask him... At, at, at some point, I always ask him to say fork handles. Fork handles... If you're not British and you don't know who two Ronnies are, you won't know what that means. Just go onto YouTube, look up two Ronnies fork handles. Just, not now, obviously, because you're watching me, but if you don't know what that is, fork handles. I need nose. Nose. Fork handles. So, yeah, so it, it the post shading thing. Post shading is. A, I don't have a video. Uh, but I'll start again. If you if you're interested in trying this post shading effect, if you haven't got an airbrush, this is a great way to get a sort of airbrush look. Now it's not perfect. It's not a perfect. Uh, it's not going to be as smooth and beautifully soft and delicate as an airbrush uh, shading job. Because, of course, you're laying down more paint. You're laying it down aggressively with a dry brushing. You do get, if you do too much dry brushing and too many layers, you can start to pick up texture. Uh, on some plastics or some surfaces, it's a terrible idea. On my um, Funko Pop Space Marine, I've got, like, grainy texture because the plastic is big, flat, open areas, and it doesn't really suit it for that. So, uh, And if you do too many different colours, like I'm only doing, I'm going to have the base colour, a medium shade, this, and then I've got a light shade, which is the phalanx yellow. I'm only doing three colours because I want to reduce any kind of speckly brush mark type stuff. Uh, and it's, so it's not anywhere near as soft and refined as an airbrush coat. But if you haven't got an airbrush, this is kind of the only way you can really get that kind of shaded effect. Um, 
you can't really rattle can pre-shading because just rattle cans are too it's like I would say like trying to rattle can pre-shading is like trying to drink water from a full speed hose like getting your garden hose putting it on full whack and then trying to take a sip of water from it yeah that's not that's not how drinking water works so yeah so pre-shading even if you could control it you if you want to get little subtle dark lines where the recesses and pan lines are you can't control a rattle can to do that bit you can maybe control it to do light coats and build up the color on top of it but it's getting the light bit so if you haven't got an airbrush it's kind of the only way you can get that kind of pre-shaded effect now, if you go into my channel uh, when you finish watching this obviously if you go onto my channel homepage and go into the playlists menu uh, there is a, a how-to playlist and in that how-to playlist, one of the more recent videos, is how to do pre-shading without an airbrush. And it's basically this technique, and it explains it properly. I can't really explain it when I'm in the middle of a live stream, but it explains it properly, how to do uh, pre-shading without an airbrush. And the trick is you're basically doing post-shading. I mean, you, you could do the black outlining. The, sort of the, the, you could do pre-shading with the black outlines as a dry brush over a light colour primer, but the trick then is without an airbrush how do you do the paint over the top and that's the trick you see so this is kind of a middle ground it could give good results once it's all weathered up and everything else <clears throat> if you're trying to make a nice reasonably clean vehicle it probably wouldn't work but if you're doing something like this which can be a little bit battered and beaten then you're absolutely fine so there you go that's that let's have a look at chat quickly uh uh, somewhere near London, he's at work now. Oh, Jimmy Manchester says I thought Fox is near Manchester. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm not actually in Manchester. I'm in Cheshire, but I'm near Manchester. Do do do. Not me. I'm in New Mexico. Says Lynn. New Mexico. What happened to old Mexico? Asks us. And Lynn says it fell off the earth. Do 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 do. I have to say, sometimes when I get um. It sounds really weird. This is going to sound really creepy, but it's not creepy, I swear. Sometimes, like, people will win stickers from me, and I have to send people stickers and stuff. So, obviously, I get them to send me their address. And sometimes, just out of just out of a sense of fun, uh, I'll look up where people live. I don't mean their exact house. I won't, like, you know, stalk them and look where the house is. But somebody says, oh, I live in, you know, whatever, uh, a particular town or something. I might go onto Google Maps and look at that town and just see what that kind of place is like. And it's fascinating just seeing where you guys all are. Uh, I say not in a not in a weird, creepy, stalkery way, but it's just fascinating, like just looking up the places you guys are to see. Because I've 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 only ever left this country twice, where well, th three times. I've been to Gran Canaria once, Tenerife once, and this, and the uh, Volnay in France once. So I'm not exactly well travelled. I don't like doing travel. I'm not a travelly type. I don't have those travelling feet, as ELO would say. So it's nice sometimes to vicariously see where people live. And the one thing you discover on Google Earth and Google Maps is that everybody has fantastically beautiful weather, apart from, like, you know, where I am. If I look at my house on Google Maps, it's, like, cloudy in September and dull and cold looking. It's like, oh, really? I mean, it's about seven years old now. It's out of date. But it's like, wow, everything was cold and dull. <laughs> but, um, yeah, everybody, every time I, you know, if I, if I do find out, look at, sort of towns and villages where people are they've always got beautiful skies and fantastic weather and beautiful landscapes so it's always fascinating to see where you guys all are so not in a not in a kind of creepy way i'm not like stalking anybody don't, don't get any worries going on there but it's always fun because i like seeing what other parts of the world are like just running fox says daniel smith have you seen any of our talk i'll start that again Daniel Smith asks, dear points of view, why, oh, why, oh, why? Uh, have you seen any of Otaku? I can't, wait, pretend coffee. The gin would be much better. Daniel Smith asks, just wondering, Fox, have you seen any of Otaku Builder's content on the YouTube? The guy's a wizard with LEDs. Uh, I think I have over time. I've, I've watched some of his stuff. I don't remember any of it because I, I, I kind of follow and watch a lot of channels, uh, but I don't do lighting. So that kind of content wouldn't wouldn't be something I would have watched. Uh, I don't do lighting because I am an idiot and I have no technical abilities whatsoever. I can barely wire a plug. If I want to wire a plug, a power plug, I have to go and look at where all the wires go because I'm that bad. 
So lighting to me, I have done lighting. I did lighting in my uh, Eagle Transporter. And that was only very, because uh, I was very kindly sent. And I do apologise because I can't remember who sent it to me. The name begins with C. Uh, I was very kindly sent a completely pre-built lighting kit for the Eagle. I just had to jam it in the kit and glue it in. So sticking something in in some bits of custom stuck in plastic card I can do. But actually building the lighting kit, I've got no idea. I'd have no no in knowledge of anything electrical. Just totally nothing at all. It's just I'm, so uh, I'm aware of his channel. I've not actually. I, I don't recall specifically his stuff though. Purely because like I said, I have, there's so many channels out there I have to keep an eye on. I very rarely get a chance to actually. It sounds really bad to say this, but I very rarely get time to watch other people's stuff. Aside from a few channels that I, you know, know and I'm familiar with, uh, catching up with other people's stuff, it's just really I don't I don't often get a lot of time. I don't actually get a lot of time just sitting glom onto YouTube, which is a sad thing to say. Christopher C, hello all, welcome Christopher. Uh, I'll only left this country once. To the former country Yugoslavia, it says Eon's car. Aha. Uh -huh. That was the last time after coming home I saw my. Hang on, let's start that again. That was only the last time after coming home I saw my. And then doesn't say what. I haven't seen him in 17 years, still happy for it though. You, you've missed something out there. Haven't seen your what. What haven't you seen in 17 years? Uh, and the same with lighting. I just find the way he fits them all into Gumpla insane, says Daniel. Oh, I've, I've seen people do insane stuff. It's just nonsense. I can't, I can't even begin. Electronics, just no idea. The problem the problem I have is that, A, I need to just wipe my nose because I get the sniffles every time the lights go on. The main problem I have is that when I was a kid at school, in the 19, early to mid, uh, mid to late 1980s, I think it didn't work at all, uh, in the 1980s, we would have learned about electricity and all that stuff in physics. That was a that was part of physics. You learn about, you know, the electricals and current and ohms and volts and all that stuff you learn about in physics. Unfortunately, it was rubbish because it was it's just really it was done in a really boring, 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 boring way. You had this piece of wood with little metal pegs and little metal strips like Meccano strips you could put across to make simple circuits and bulbs and stuff. And it was done in a really boring way. And it was like, oh dear Lord, this is in no way interesting. I am bored. None of this is going in. I don't care. I don't, I don't, I'll never have to make a circuit to make a light bulb go on. I don't care. It was just done in such a boring way that it put me off. And I never learned all that stuff. And I've said before, if... It's weird, but the moment I left secondary school, well, not the moment, but within a few years of leaving secondary school, uh, and within, well, okay, let's not say a few years, once I'd left secondary school and then people invented the internet, let's get more specific, once I had access to an internet, uh, and I could find information about science out myself, I learnt much more sciencey stuff just by having an internet and reading and watching science documentaries than i ever did at school for biology because we, when i was at school it was biology physics and chemistry and that was it not the single science subject which was biology chemistry physics chemistry terrified me because i just didn't understand it at all and it bored the living carp out of me really didn't care it made no sense at all uh, biology was interesting. I did enjoy that. And it, it was a good teacher we had. It was just, again, it was 1980s secondary school British curriculum was not interesting. Uh, and I think that's where I suffered a bit. Because at that, at that time, science at school was so boring. I didn't really enjoy secondary school. So I was so reluctant to be doing any kind of education. Pink one off the lid. God damn it. I was so reluctant. I hated school. So... I was reluctant to sort of learn anything, even voluntarily, so I didn't do any of that. But as soon as I left school, and I realised this wealth of information, there was some interesting stuff, and I, you know, I had occasion to then voluntarily watch episodes of Horizon, for example. 
Whereas before, the only time I ever watched Horizon or QED or anything like that was because the teacher was having a lazy day and just put the telly on in the in the biology lab and says, right, we watch this program. There you go. Right now, bugger off and go and have your lunch. And that was it because they had an easy day. Then they could just sit and sit in the in the back room with all the plants and lizards and snakes having a fag talking to the lab assistant while we just sat and watched a program about I don't know. The QED was always the one with lightning and they drive the car through the massive industrial Van de Graaff generator. For some reason, the biology class, whenever he showed us a science video, it was always the one about sex, like sexual reproduction. Or what was the other one? There was another one that was not in any way interesting. But I must have watched that same like half hour long, all about human reproduction episode like 10 times. Because it's, it's like, he must have forgotten that we'd already watched it. And it wasn't even... It, you know, you think a room full of 15 year olds, it'll be a bit chaotic. But you know what? It was so boring. It was such a boring 1980s British science program. Yeah. So, yeah, my science education was boring and put me off. But as soon as I left school and then the Internet occurred, the Internet happened and I could suddenly start finding things for myself. I was like, wow, this is brilliant. Why didn't I learn about quantum mechanics when I was at school? I would have loved the crap out of this. I would have been wrapped and wrapped and just fascinated by this. This is brilliant. Something can be in two different states. Oh, oh, and the relative. Oh, I would have been like enwrapped. I would have been like just a science monster if I'd learned that stuff. It's like in history. It's, it's, history was the same. What did we learn in secondary school history in the 1980s? We learned about the Tudors, the Stuarts, the Normans the anglo-saxons which is which is interesting don't get me wrong it's interesting but it's the 1980s you've got a room full of 13 or 14 year olds the only thing they want to know about is the germans and the war that's all we cared but like when i was a kid in the 70s when we used to go around to each other you know playing each other's gardens we played war games you know, in the 50s and 60s, people might have been, I don't know, before that, people might have been like cowboys and Indians or something. But when I was playing out with mates, we were playing like we had toy guns and things or whatever. We used sticks as machine guns. We would, it was World War Two. It was, you know, shooting Germans. We used to have a field uh, near where I live and we'd go and hang out in the trees. We'd sit there and fall out of trees all day in the 70s. And every time a train came past, in our minds, it would be full of German soldiers and we'd have to like duck down into the bushes and take pot shots at the train as it was going past. It was grand. This is the thing. So, a load of 13, 14 year olds in the 1980s, the only history we gave a crap about was World War II. Didn't care about the Tudors and Stuarts. We had no interest in that at all. And my God, it was boring. And this is the other thing. Like, you know, you learn about the Tudors and the Stuarts and the anglo saxons Oh God, it was so boring. So, so boring. And yet, and yet... Left school, got an internet, uh, and suddenly got access to like many, many different programs on things like the BBC iPlayer, documentaries, and, and you know, Time Team became a thing, and I got into that, and then to the point where nowadays I will happily sit there and lap up any program that result, that deals with history or archaeology or anything like that you know anthropology i will sit and watch documentaries about egyptians romans greeks uh even documentaries about tudors and stuarts british history you know anything like that because it's all fascinating it's all fascinating it's just the way it's taught so i suffered from a really boring 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 education and i don't think it's any fault of the actual teachers i think they were doing the best with what they had I think the curriculum at the time was just boring as hell. It was stuck in the 1950s and 60s. It was tedious. I mean, thank God I didn't have to. I, w I wasn't in the smart. We when, the, when I got into like the fifth form, we had in those days, we had streaming, which was where the fifth form, because I was in a school where I had fifth form and then you're like first, second, third. It wasn't like, you know, year six, year seven. Secondary school was you start off as a first year, first, second, third, fourth, fifth year, fifth year, you then either do your GCSEs. We were the first people to do GCSEs or second, I think. You do your GCSE, you either stay at school and do your A-levels. We had six, form and upper six, or you, you bugger off and go and get a job. I stayed into the sixth form. But when we got to the third year, uh, what was it the sixth form? You, into the third year, you were streamed. So in third year, you either had the, the smart people 
who shared all the same lessons in curriculum as you, but they also did Latin and Greek and German. Go figure. Uh, and in my set, because I was in the not quite so smart set, I'll be honest and say I was in the I was in the bit dumb set. I was in the in the lower set. Uh, we did, uh, thankfully not Greek. Thank God. Thankfully not Latin. We did. Uh, thank. Uh, we did uh, French. What did we do? We did French, and we had two other subjects that they didn't have. I think we had French religious education which is an absolute waste of time Just don't even get me started on that uh and something else because this was in the days before secondary school students had things like sociology and all these like combined studies now we had it was a classic education classical education it was like you know french german greek all that there's no spanish or anything like that i'm kind of jealous now of the kind of stuff that kids get nowadays now, i would have liked to have done german i'll be honest and say i did i did not feel bad that I was missing out on latin and greek because seriously, what was the point in the 1980s of learning Latin or Greek? Unless you were going to go into very specific employment that would benefit from those. Just no point whatsoever. Absolutely. Unless you're going to like, you know, live in Greece or do a classic type stuff that, where you needed Latin, history or biology or anything like that. No point whatsoever. Whereas I did French, which is a bit more useful because it was a kind of common business language at the time. Uh, and then for my A-levels, I did French for business. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so I was in the, I was in the slightly not quite so smart set. <laughs> I'm quite happy to say that. And Lynn Dipple says, then Time Team came along. Yes, but that's the thing. Like History was so boring. But then in the 90s, I was lapping up Time Team because it suddenly made all that stuff that had been horrendously boring at school interesting. And programs like that. And then nowadays you have things like, uh, you know, you have. I mean, I, I, I go nuts over any kind of science or history documentary programming now, especially from the well, I say just from the BBC, because ITV don't do anything of any importance. There's nothing ITV makes that's even worth watching. They don't do any kind of science or um, history or anything like that. There's nothing educational ITV does that's even worth, worth mentioning. It's just all drivel. ITV is just an absolute abortion of a channel. There's nobody with any brain should watch anything ever produced by ITV. Um, but yeah, BBC's like, you know, you've got obviously you've got your science stuff, so you've got absolute legends like, you know, Professor Brian Cox for your cosmology and your physics. You've got uh, Dr. Kevin Fong for your biology and stuff like that. Uh, biology and interlinked with space stuff you've got your sky at nights uh, you've got all your science programming and then you've got like all the cool historical stuff like you've got doctor you've got lucy worsley who's absolutely awesome she's hilarious for she focuses on your kind of like uh tudors and stuarts and that kind of era but she puts a real sort of personal strain on it uh you've got uh hannah fry who's a mathematician and statistician i mean who would have thought 30 years ago when i you know, when i was at school that i would have voluntarily watched a program about statistics i mean really but i've watched programs about statistics and most notably because hannah fry is awesome professor hannah fry and dr hannah fry she's awesome and i'm, I'm kind of fancy it just a little bit but uh, there's other ones they've done with other presenters on there. Uh, presenters who I've, I have actually listened to as well on things like the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. They've been on there and I can't remember his name, but he's a really good statistician. He's, he's a fascinating presenter. So yeah, I, I would, who would have thought I would have watched programs about statistics? Uh, Daniel Smith does say, Fox, the bill was on ITV. Yes, that's, I'm talking about modern ITV. If you go back 10 or 15 years, ITV had some great uh, programming. I mean, they, they took Morecambe and Wise off the BBC and you've got to give them credit. But nowadays, what's on ITV now that's worth watching? Uh, nothing. It's all phone-in celebrity crap. It's all lowest common denominator mouth-breathing drivel. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's still mouth-breathing drivel on BBC, but they also do fantastic science and history programming, documentary, factual programming. Um, I will say, though, I, I tend not to watch... Uh, American science programming or factual documentaries. I do sometimes, but I, I kind of grew up on BBC stuff and I find the American style of uh, science education, not completely, but for a lot of it, I find it just too 
I don't know, too flashy, patronising type. Uh, you know, I mean, like, you know, Through the Wormhole, that's good. Obviously, you've got things like Cosmos, the original Cosmos. I, found, I thought that, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos was all right, but it was not even a mark on Carl Sagan's Cosmos. It's just, you know. Uh, but for the for the most part, most sort of non most sort of US science programming is kind of garbage because it's kind of just treating the viewer like a moron. Every time what it's like, uh, it, it's, you know, it's not something that we don't do. I mean, I've seen you know BBC science programs where I'm, I've watched five or ten minutes and thought I can't watch this because the presenter's an ass or you're talking to me like I'm a mouth breathing idiot, which I'm not. I don't know this I, I tend to not watch a lot of the american stuff the u.s science stuff because it just i don't know it's just the way they present it it's too flashy too much pizzazz i much prefer things like horizon all that kind of stuff i don't know there is good stuff i've watched some good stuff but you know there's some things i can't watch uh lynn dipple says fox american docs are garbage but do bear in mind of course lynn is american so i feel validated now <laughs> some are, she says. Uh, Eons Carr says, I used to watch some shows on history, National Geographic, sometimes BBC and Sky when we had Sky, now we've got Now TV. Yeah, National Geographic used to do some good stuff, but they've kind of gone... It, 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 it's just the tabloidization of a lot of factual programming, I think, as it, it's just happened. This isn't like an old man rant, this is just the truth. A lot of it's just become real lowbrow tabloid nonsense. Uh, I'm going to put some more tissue. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's things like when you get channels like Discovery. I mean, come on, Discovery in the 1990s, Discovery was like a major channel that produced some awesome, awesome content. So I know the US channels have produced good content. But somehow, like Discovery channels and things like that, they've suddenly, they've, they've fallen. You go from them producing amazing series on all kinds of things to fake documentaries about megalodon really Re that you know you you can tell it obviously fake but some people think it's real and you sit there and you're like first of all really people believe this and then you think no wait yes people do and then you think hang on why are you presenting this as real and i'm sure there was some uh, as on that geo or discovery series about Oh, was it about Nazis on the moon or Nazis making in space? Some sort of absolute nonsense, just fant which is fine as a concept, but not on a channel that's supposed to be actual intelligent and scientific. I don't know. It's just weird. Everybody seems to have dumbed down lately. Even BBC do it now a lot, but they seem to. Series like Horizon and stuff. Uh, Arthur McNichol says, Foxy, what you should be watching is Duncan and Peachy on Warhammer TV. I do. I do. I have uh, I have one I have one Twitch uh, membership, and that is to Warhammer TV, purely so I can watch Peachy and Duncan. I've not watched it for a while. I tend to, while I'm watching, uh, while I'm playing Elite Dangerous, uh, I either listen to podcasts or I catch up on episodes of uh, Painting with Peachy and Duncan or where they play games or where they do other stuff, uh, play, you know, like Shade Spire and stuff. So I watch, I binge watch them while I'm playing Elite Dangerous because Elite Dangerous I can I can just treat Peachy and Duncan as a podcast and have it playing because there's no, you know I can sit there and quite happily take in what they're doing if I'm playing Elite because Elite's not like a you're just flying around in space and mapping planets it's not not that demanding of your attention so yeah so I do, I, um, so that's my only subscription on Twitch is to their channel purely for that reason. I have to say, though, I love Peachy and Duncan to bits. I'm not that keen on the other guy. I mean, nothing against him personally. He's just... Mm, I can't remember his name now. I forget what his name is. I love I love Duncan to bits, obviously. Duncan's awesome. Peachy's grown on me a lot. since he, At first I was like, ooh. Then I was like, no, actually, I like Peachy a lot. Uh, but the other guy... Mm, mm, nah. I kind of... I kind of knowingly not watch his video. I will watch them, but I don't know. I'd be more likely not to watch one of his painting videos all the way through. I don't know what it is. It's just, say, so it's nothing personal against him. It's just, I don't know what it is. It's Maybe it's his presenting style. Maybe it's, I don't know. Just something about the way he presents and stuff that doesn't, doesn't work for me. Don't know. 
Who him with the blackish beard says I thought. Yes, that's the chap. I can't remember his name. Nick, is it Nick? I can't remember. Nick Baton, that's it. I mean, I'm sure he's all right. I'm sure he's a nice bloke and everything else. I've, I've seen him when he's been on like the, the Hangout and Painting stuff, and he's all right. But in terms of his painting tutorials, that's just something that doesn't doesn't sit right for me. Do, 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 do. That's why I don't have a cable subscription or antenna, says Average Modeler, that most TV is crap. Uh, I, in 1995, here's the thing. In 1995, I got a job working for the local cable company, which in those days was 9X. New York, New England, and X is for the future. Which is bizarre, considering I live in, like, northwest England. But hey, it was new at the time. We didn't really have cable at that point. So I started working for 9X, did for five years. And, of course, I got, like, a very reduced price uh, cable TV package. Um, got the paint off the pot again. It's just getting on my nerves so much. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I got a very reduced cable TV package. And up until that point, I was happily watching TV, which is normal terrestrial TV. Got cable TV, got access to tons of channels, and kind of stopped watching TV at that point. Because it was just dross. It really was. Uh, and that's the thing. I don't really watch... I, I, I don't watch TV anymore nowadays. I The only TV I ever watch is like iPlayer for BBC stuff. Uh, or, you know, Amazon Prime for like some series that we'll watch. But I'll never... I haven't turned on a television other than to, to, no. the only time I turn the television now is when I'm also turning on my Xbox at the same time to shoot fools or fly through space. So I haven't watched proper TV. Mama Fox downstairs, she's got somehow, I don't know how, but considering I used to work for 9X in the, in the mid 90s and I left, that became 9X became cable and wireless and then cable and wireless took them over and then it became NTL. And then I left in about the year 2000 when it was still NTL. And then they got taken over by Virgin. Somehow, I've still got the staff package. Like, what? 20 years later, I've still got the staff. Don't tell them. But I've still got the staff package. I've not been there since like 2000. Nearly 25 years, I've still got the staff package. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I don't watch it. I just keep it for Mama Fox. Um... And she watches all kinds of stuff, but then she's, you know, the older generation than me, so she's quite happy to. Whereas I think I was I was of that generation where we were the last real generation to, to have only terrestrial TV. You know, we were the last generation to have four or five channels. Four channels in my case. Um the generation that came after me sort of may have started out with three or four channels the same, but they then kind of when they were just leaving school or anything like that, or just doing secondary school, they had the cable or the sky. So I think we were really kind of the last, roughly the last generation that actually had that kind of, I wouldn't say golden age TV, because you know, there's a lot of crap even in those days, but there is a website, there was a website called TV Cream, which was like the golden age of TV and all the programs. It was quite a funny website, but it kind of was the 70s and 80s, well, the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, before cable came in and everybody had to compete. So we were like one of the last generations to have that. And so since then, I've just not, it's just, it's, I don't, there's absolutely nothing at all on ITV that I have any reason at all to watch ever. It's all just trash. It really is. I mean, so I've got BBC to play. I play it and I depend on that for a lot of things. Love it. Science, history, factual programming. I can't beat it. Absolutely can't. Nobody makes proper scientific factual programming like the BBC. Nobody in the world, anywhere. Don't care who you put forward. Don't care what you're talking about. Nobody makes factual programs, science and stuff, as well as the BBC. End of discussion. Just completely. Don't care who you put forward. It's not going to work. Uh, I think I loaded up the ITV equivalent of the iPlayer, the catch-up thing, once to watch something. I can't remember what. There's probably something specific I wanted to watch. They very, very, very occasionally, very occasionally, do some kind of factual program. It tends to be like a one-off. Um, and it tends to be something that's maybe still bordering on the celebrity bullshit but they'll do it very occasionally and it'll be like okay i fancy watching that but it's on itv catch-up thing i'm like mm. 
So, you know, I, I load up the ITV player and it's, oh, look, I get adverts the same as I do on normal TV. Joy, deep joy. Uh, and the quality is terrible. <laughs> like I play, you, you go into it, you press play, you watch the program, end of. Uh, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, anything like that. Dave, the catch-up TV where you go and watch their equivalent of iPlayer. You get buffering, you get lag, you get adverts for a start, obviously. It's just all, it's all absolute bish, basically. <sighs> Old man rants. Um... Let's have a look. Shark Week is something, uh, says Lynn. Yeah, well, Shark Week would be great. They started off doing Shark Week uh, well, and then, like I say, they just became crap. Like Megalodon, that whole thing. Fake documentaries. One of the, I can't remember what the World War II one was. It was like fake Nazi stuff, but it was really was like the Nazis made flying saucers. I don't know. They've just become crappy. It's like sci-fi. Sci-fi was a great channel until it became sy fy then it was an absolute garbage channel i'll never forget uh when sci-fi first changed to syfy from actual sci-fi channel because remember i used to work for 9x at the time so we had a lot of access to all this stuff um it was a great channel they had mystery science theater 3000 they had star trek they had uh you know all the different star treks loads of different series you could watch it was absolutely brilliant brilliant series uh, channel and then they became SYFY, SFI, and they changed it. And they said, right, now we're going to do like WCW wrestling. And I'm like, what? What's wrestling got to do with sci-fi? Apparently they were like, well, we want to widen our appeal to other things. I'm like, really? You're just talking out your ass now. So you're a channel called sci-fi. Your modus operandi is science fiction programming. And you want to widen your audience by doing wrestling and non-science fiction programming what are you on apparently it didn't work and they just got panned for it so as far as i remember i kind of vaguely forgotten it now anyway so but yeah stuff like that so i don't know where i'm going i'm waffling now please stop me uh let's have a look do, do, do. over here in the us in america all the good channels went to reality stuff says lynn dipple yeah that's the thing. It all became reality. And I, th I think it's more about... I don't think it's about that the channels became crap. I think it's more about the viewers. They There was a shift in viewership. And I think... Maybe it's a, maybe it's a catch-22. I don't know. But I think people's requirements changed. And now people are more happy to watch the reality TV crap than actual proper programming. And I think the channels realise, hey, I can spend a... Millions of pounds or dollars, whatever, making this program about X, Y, and Z with a presenter and classy subjects and proper, or I can just get a load of absolute plonkers to just be tools in front of the camera doing whatever they're doing. And it'll be divisive and everybody will have conversations about it and we'll make loads of money and advertisers will love it. And it's like, yeah, that's where you went wrong. That's where you went wrong. I hate reality TV. I absolutely despise it. I absolutely loathe it. And I don't just mean, yeah, you know, following people around, doing the thing. Uh, just all of that. Especially when it's either reality TV, where it's celebrity-based. Oh, God, I hate that. God, I hate that. Or, even worse, celebrity reality-type nonsense where there's a game show element. Like Big Brother and stuff. It's just phoning crap. Oh, God, I hate all of it. Welcome to Fox's two hours of ranting about things he doesn't like and shouting at the clouds. It's old man ranting time. Yes. Uh, no one wants to learn about anything unless it has to do with movie stars or musicians, says Lynn. Yep. I think I think channels started dumbing stuff down and as a as a as a catch twenty two, audiences got dumber because they were fed more dumb crap. And because the audience is now dumber, they're crap with dumb crap and the studios can spend less making dumb crap and it's just never gonna end. And we're all going to die. The whole world is doomed. Everything sucks. And uh, yeah, good luck with that. Anyway, let's move on from this depressing subject. Doodle -doo -doo, doodle -doo -doo. So everybody out there, how are you all today? I hope you're all well. I've got to ask the question. Because nobody else has yet. Uh, of course, what is in your belly and what is on your bench? Bench and belly time. Uh, what's on your bench? What are you working on right now? 
and what's in your belly. What are you going to have for dinner or what are you planning uh, You know, later on or what have you had for your dinner, depending on where you are in the big wide world. Uh, me personally, my our plan for dinner tonight apparently is Chinese. Woohoo! Yes, Chinese takeaway. I love my local Chinese. Which, as I've explained before, will be a wonton soup with an extra portion of shumai to put in the wonton soup. Oh, yes. Uh, and then a, a load of Japanese beef udon to go with that as the main course. I will be happy, 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 happy. Very, very happy. That'll be me. Uh, Daniel Smith says it's like the Towie lot and all the add-on shows they made. There's one about two of them having babies. Well done, you've done what most of the population can do. Yeah, it's just things like you know the only way is Essex, like we've got, or I suppose the American equivalent is stuff like Jersey Shore and things like that. If that is that, a, I don't really know. Is Jersey Shore is that like a reality? Follow these nutters around as they do dumbass crap. I don't know. Yeah, we get the same stuff over here, and it's just like drivel it is just drivel absolute drivel and then the terrestrial channels like you know bbc and itv and well maybe more itv and that just wonder why online providers amazon and netflix are doing much better because they're giving us stuff we want to watch not just mindless drivel the only reality tv i actually enjoy watching ever um for the most part, it's stuff where it's, you know, following police around, doing police things. Uh, like, you know, uh, uh, traffic cops or coppers was a good one. Not American ones. I don't, I don't find them interesting, but the British ones, like, you know, uh, chopper coppers was good. The, the road wars was fantastic because the, the, the commentator, the narrator used to take the mickey out of the people that were being arrested because they were all invariably plonkers. And the only reason I like those is not because I find it fascinating what the police are doing, uh, but it's really, I get to laugh at how stupid the kind of people that would actually normally watch that kind of celebrity nonsense program are because they're always that kind of person, mouth breathing morons that get arrested for like you know being sourced up and being a tool or being sober and being a tool or just generally being a tool so i get to laugh at mouth breathing morons falling foul of the law which is i watch that quite happily american ones not so much but uk ones road wars was fantastic so the, the for the first three or four i think four or five series until they got the guy that presented it, who sounded a bit like Daniel Craig, was fantastic. Uh, then they got rid of him and they got some woman who tried too hard to be like him and it wasn't funny at all then. Uh, Craig Charles, sorry, I think narrated it, not Daniel Craig. Um, so yeah, then they got rid of him and got some woman who just wasn't funny because she was trying too hard to be the same style as him and it wasn't her style. I think it was Red Wars where I first he used to refer to people as spanners and that's where I got the spanner from, calling people spanners. This bloke, this spanner here, he's trying to do this and that. But yeah, no, television nowadays, I, I don't watch it. I'd much rather use online services to watch the thing I actually want to watch because I know it's going to be worth watching. Let's have a look at Bench and Belly, what you've all been saying. Uh, we have... La, 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 la. Athelman McNichol says, Roll on next year, Love Island from South Africa, banned. I will... Oh, God, triggered, so triggered. Just absolute... And it's like I go on the BBC News website to look at, you know, the news in the world that's happening. And there's guaranteed to be like three or four things on the front page about Love Island. I'm like, who gives a crap? Why is this news? It's just nonsense. It's pointless mouth-breathing drivel. Don't start doing that, BBC. Seriously. Don't use my license my license fee to produce drivel. It's bad enough we get celebrity ice dancing nonsense bake-off crap. Oh. Yeah, moving on. Um, uh, uh, Lynn Dibble says Fox I've learned so much from you painting thank you very much I'm glad it's stuck in uh, Athol McNichol says Nurgle and a chicken curry awesome he's working on Nurgle I guess and he's he's having a ch or had a chicken curry for his lunch 
Uh, I don't think he's having a Nurgle and chicken curry. <laughs> that would be weird. Haven't thought about food today, says Retro Rabbit Studios. Then you're doing the day wrong. You should think about food all the time. And when you're not thinking about food, you should be eating food. It's the only time you shouldn't think about food. You should be eating it. Uh, we William Wilms, welcome William says real grade tall geese three and dinner plans is grilled chicken carrots and apple sauce. Oh yeah. Oh excuse me, I did, never thought about having apple sauce with chicken, but it sounds like a delightful idea. Uh, Eon's car says bench conquest. Working on his Warhammer conquest. I'm so behind on that. It's terrifying. It's actually giving me sleepless nights. Uh, belly chicken and bacon Caesar wrap f tea freezer food. Yeah. Kick ass. I need some more tissue. Tissue time. Uh, where are we up to? Daniel Smith says bench F91 Gundam. Yes. Cool. Very small that Gundam there. Uh, belly chicken parmo and a northeast. Uh, sorry, chicken parmo a northeast treat. Uh, I've not come across chicken parmo. You now need to explain this northeastern treat to me. Why I? I want to know what is this chicken parmo? Oh, that's terrible more. I know. I can't. I, I'm no good at Geordies. The only thing I can say is unlucky. Day 45 in the Big Brother house. Some moron is doing something stupid. And we're all going to point and laugh. Or I can, of course, say spooky. Bite a growth. That's all I can do. So what is chicken parmo? Explain this. If it's a treat, I need to know about it. Uh, I liked watching Police Interceptors. He owns car. But yeah, Mama Fox likes that. I've never actually watched that. I think I've seen one or two. Uh, what was the one I used to love? There was one, I think it was Coppers, it was on Channel 4, and it was like, it was kind of like following the police around as they do their job, but the police were basically just, they were allowed to say the things, because like, if you watch these things where they follow the police around, and they'll show you like, you know, Ted and Dave in the car, they'll go and, they'll go and arrest some, some plonk, some like, plonker for doing something, and then they'll have... The, the copper in this in the office later on talking to camera saying well yes we saw this car and we knew something wasn't right right so we did this and we did that and this is what happened and then we arrest and they'll give you the they'll be narrating it as it happens but i think it was coppers where the cop the policemen were like rather than saying you're on the bbc now can you just talk properly and and, and don't express opinions this was like if you think the guy's a tit just say this bloke's a nutter so the coppers are like, yeah, we, we were going along and I just had my lunch and stuff. And then his car pulled out and this absolute nutter was driving. And he was absolute bonkers. This guy was a complete plonker. I've never seen anything. And it was brilliant because it was so refreshing because it was so casual and relaxed. And the, the, my favourite bit of that whole series, if it was called Coppers, I think, uh, the title sequence where they've got two guys in, I think it was a Subaru, like a Scooby-Doo. They've got a Subaru in Pretzer, a police car. And it just starts off with the guy pumping the seat down to get it right. And he's like, driving along going, nee, no, nee, no. <laughs> and then at one point he's like, booyah, kasha, check out my car. As he's driving along in this police car. I'm like, I'm liking the style of this series now. This is quite amusing. I think they did two or three series of that. It was quite good because it was refreshing for the coppers to be there going, this bloke was an absolute dick. And yeah, just giving their opinions was really nice. Rather than having to be all, you know, careful about what they said. It's like, nah, this bloke was a plonker. Nah, I love that. <sighs> Belly just had cinnamon pancakes with maple syrup, says Lynn Dipple. Oh, maple syrup. Oh, yes. Uh, bench, she puts that in capitals, by the way, because she knows I like me some maple syrup. Uh, bench, still not yet. Saving up monies for it. Lynn is in the process of saving up monies to make him buy her bench. She just moved house. Uh... Doodle -doo. I thought my nickel says Love Island is great because when it's like me, you're 66. It's good to see what the younger generation is rabbiting on about. No, it's not because the younger generation is just rabbiting on about bollocks. There's nothing of any importance. Trust me on this. You're not learning anything. I'm 50 and it's almost I'm almost 50 and it's like there's nothing of any there's nothing to be mined there. There's really nothing of any value in that. Uh just I, I don't know. Just I don't know frustrating such tv i mean i'm sure you know i don't know it's just, that kind of program just really triggers me into oh it's lowest common denominator cheap production nonsense oh, i hate it hate it hate it hate it phone in stuff oh frankie goes towards in hi frankie hi fox straight back from work so nothing on my bench gehackste bruchten with onions in my belly gehacktes i got that wrong gehacktes bruchten bruchten 
Gehaktus Burschten. I can't translate that. Gehaktus Burschten. Gehaktus Burschen. There we go. Gehaktus Burschen. I can't translate any of that. I can normally figure out. So is that a broth? Is Burschen broth? Gehakt. I can't remember what that is. I, I kind of vaguely know. I, cause I, don't, I never learned German, but I can translate some bits and bobs. Uh, we'll need to know what that is. Gehaktet Brutschen. Something broth, I think that means. I could be wrong. Uh, uh, Daniel Smith explains chicken parma. Here we go. Chicken parma is a breaded chicken fillet with a thick bechamel sauce covered in cheese. Not very healthy, but it tastes fantastic. It sounds like it tastes fantastic. I can fully understand why this would be a, uh, a northeastern treat. Why, I? It's a breaded chicken fillet with a thick bechamel sauce covered in cheese. Not very healthy. I can't do it. I do apologize. I can't do a, a towny accent. I can't. I wish I could. I really wish I could. Because it. I do actually like the Geordie accent. It's a fantastic accent. But I can't do it. I shall not embarrass anybody further. Uh, Athol says, well, sorry, Foxy, but this yellow is doing misers. I'm off to eat my curry. Enjoy your curry, dude. Enjoy completely. I'm jealous. I wish I had curry tonight, but I'm not. Uh, yep, have fun. Uh, let's have a look. Athol McNichol says, glad my eyes aren't the only ones doing that. <laughs> doodly, 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 doodly. Um, Lynn and Average Model are talking about local interests. I think they're both not local to each other, but closer by. Dad's in. Afternoon all reporting from nursing home with wifey. Hey, Dad. Hope you're doing well. Hope he's doing well. I'm guessing you're in briefly. You're on the mobile later, aren't you? So you'll have probably choppiness. But welcome, welcome, welcome. Pre-evening, Dad. The question has been asked. Yes, yeah, because you weren't here, so I had to ask the question for you. But we don't mind. Oh, no, I missed it, Eon. So, Dad, the question for you. What's on your bench? What's on your belly? There you go. You haven't answered it yet. Everybody else has answered it. You haven't answered it yet. Bench und belly, Father. Lynn Dipple, I've been here for over one year. What, in this particular stream? Wow. No, she means in a house. I didn't think it was that... I didn't think you'd been there that long. I didn't realise it's almost a year now, or over a year. Wow. I thought it was more recent than that that you moved. Now, you can see here on these, on these fuel tanks, I am getting quite a patchy effect here with the paint with this dry brush i'm using a bigger dry brush it's a stiffer dry brush and i'm getting a real kind of patchy effect but you know what i like it i like it a lot it's the kind of effect i'm going for a worn patchy effect. i mean i might go over some of this with like hazard striping or black and white checkers or some kind of checkers possibly i don't know yet but i might not I might just leave it all as yellow and again like i said before uh it's like a it's like a comic book art it looks terrible when it's just watercolors it's when you get the ink on that it all starts to coalesce and come together so i'm not too fussed but I, and again i don't think you'll be able to see on camera but because of this dry brushing we're doing this post shading we go from a dark dirty browny yellow color to the recessed panel lines which are now this really dark brown color because of the agrax earth shade and then you go to the agrax color the uh, avalanche sunset which is the next yellow along and then that blends away into this slightly brighter patchier yellow which is the urial yellow uh, and it's all blended now you can't might see that i've got a few little spots of paint on here it's actually paint transfer from my gloves that's transferred from the pot little sort of spots there again i'm not fussed because we are going to be doing paint chipping on here so if i get a little spot of paint that's transferred from the pot to my glove and then dried a bit and then transferred to the model that's fine i'll just put a paint chip there Brilliant. might give me ideas for paint chips later on uh, Dad says bench, a scrap jet belly. I'll start again. Scrent, bench, scrap jet. He's making the uh, the orc boom decker. No, that's the snaz wagon. The scrap jet. Uh, and sausage dinner on the way home. Yes. Sausage dinner. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yes, Lynn's saying she's been at the hospital she works at for nine months. She's been in the nine months. At, at the, I'll start again. She's been at the hospital she's working at for a year. She's been in a new house for nine months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dad says, hey, Quanaman, I hope they find your bike. Lynn says, question, what happened to your bike? 
I don't know. Fox, imagine a raw beefsteak on a bun. I am now imagining that. I am very, very hungry. Oh, yes. Uh, I missed what in chat. Oh, Kevin's in. Cy Reynolds, our current stream boss, it should be pointed out. Current stream boss Cy Reynolds is in. All is now right with the world, he says. Kevin has arrived. Welcome, Kevin. You've missed me ranting about crappy modern TV and young people. You've missed me shouting at the clouds, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, but bench and belly, Kev. Bench and belly. Do 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 I like a good shout at the clouds sometimes. It just gets the frustrations out. I know, it, it, I kind of get these old man rants on, but the thing is, of course, I don't really get a chance to do it during the day. So when I come on with you guys, you're going to get the brunt of it. <laughs> you're going to get me whinging about something. Young people today. Whoa. Right, so that looks scruffy as all get out. It looks patchy and scruffy. And you know what? It's beautiful. I love it. You've got a dark patch there that blends into a light patch. You've got these dark stains where the panel line is and it just blends away. Fantastic. I could I could do more dry brushing to get a lighter Uriel yellow, Uriel yellow patch. But I don't want to do too much because that will start getting a texture to it. And I don't want to get a, a sort of grainy texture. That is a big risk. So I'm going to leave it as that. If they look rough and ready, that's great because they're fuel tanks. They're going to look rough and ready. They're going to be dirty and scrumpy and horrible. Dear size says bench nothing. I'm waiting to be called back in for a job interview. Belly a bugman's burger. You're at Warhammer World again, aren't you? If you're having a bugman's burger, so I'm going to guess Simon is at or still at or at. I can't remember if it was today or yesterday. Uh, Warhammer World. How what's a bugman's burger like? Tell me what the food's like at Bugman's. Is it good? Is it awesome? Is it top notch? Turn that off. Uh, Quantum says, I parked up out front of the house to come in to put my helmet away and stick the kettle on when they went. Oh, I'll start again. Hang on. Quantum says, I parked up out front of the house, came in to put my helmet away and stick the kettle on, then went. Then when it got a bit later, I went to bring the bike in so it didn't get nicked, only to find it stolen. That's rubbish. I assume you mean motorbike, not obviously pedal bike. Dude, that sucks. <laughs> I guess the thing with the motorbike is that if you're able to, I suppose the problem is with a car, you've got to be able to break into the car, get it started and drive it away. If you can't get access to the keys with a motorbike, you can just lift that sucker up and put it on a flatbed and drive it away and figure out getting it to work later on, I suppose. So I guess that's something you've got to keep in mind with motorbikes. I'm not a motorbike kind of person, so I don't, I don't know. You can't really lift up a car and put it on the back of your flatbed truck, I guess. I'm back. Yes, Fox. Food is pretty good. Burger has bacon, cheese, onion, jam. Jam? Onion jam? What's onion jam? Oh, you mean like like a chutney type stuff. Onion jam, pulled pork and barbecue sauce and some salad that has no space on my burger. <gasps> I need you to, to, to just give me that now. And also, you really want salad on your burger because it gives you a little bit of extra. It's like the, it's like garnish. You're allowed leafy stuff as long as there's plenty of meats. And don't forget, of course, onion jam is technically salad. Cheese is technically salad because cheese is made from leaves or something. See, I'm getting this transfer from the paint pot. Now, look at that there. Not a big problem because we can blend it away, but it's, it's still annoying as hell that I have to then try and blend it away. We can build in paint chips and things later on, though. It's not the end of the world. But this is why the one downside to dry brushing with these Citadel paints is the transfer from pot to hand. It's very annoying. There's no way to deliberately avoid it because you, chances are you're going to get some paint on your hand from the pot because of its dumbass design. Games Workshop. It's most likely been stripped for parts, uh, says Quanaman, but the insurance is paying out so I can replace it. That's the thing. Never fly without, as they say in Elite Dangerous, never fly without a rebuy. I don't think this paint is from now. Actually, this paint is from previously because it's actually gone solid so that's from a previous transfer i think i think it's annoying but we can get paint chips and stuff on it or there might be i can do ink lining and shading so i'm not losing sleep about it it's not the end of the world 
again this isn't even weathered yet this is just base colors so I'm not I'm not panicking about it depending on the next hour the male spear bugman's bugman's six a six x ale in the belly we'll see cool I take it you're not actually driving then <laughs> cool good luck Kevin says Lynn Space Hamster's in. Welcome, Space Hamster. There's not enough paint on there. Space Hamster says, The sad thing is, I've never played Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know what we're talking about. I have never played. I've played precisely one, well, two tabletop games, and that was on the my local Warhammer store anniversary, or the Warhammer Day, where they had a couple of games. Store birthday or whatever. Okay, this brush is suddenly not doing its job. Let me get a bigger brush. I need to rinse that one off. The thing about dry brushing when you're using any kind of slightly bigger brushes is eventually the brush will get a bit clogged with paint. And you really want to just stop at that point and go to a different brush just because the paint on there is drying out and that's when you start to get scritches and scratches transferred into the paint that you're dry brushing on. And you want the dry brush to be as soft as possible. So we should put that to one side. Uh, I'm being also quite cautious about using too many brushes today because uh, currently at the moment I have that much brush cleaner left. <laughs> I've ordered some more, but unfortunately it takes forever to get to me. So I don't want to get too many brushes on the go. But for this, I'm going to use a big fat brush. Yeah, so the one thing Quano Man knows is never fly without a rebuy. Aside from that, anybody that drives around without insurance is a tool. Anyway, always have insurance. Having a, having a car and not have insurance, there's no excuse for it. Mm -hmm. I never have sympathy for someone who... has a vehicle but can't be bothered having insurance or road tax or anything like that no sympathies mm -hmm. eee, wait that's a good question about the insurance it says Lee. riding with insurance is a crime now riding without insurance driving without insurance is a crime if your car is not insured, you can have it seized at the roadside. They can pull you over, seize your car, take it away. Uh, and you can get it back by paying a lot of money and you get points on the license and then you have to have insurance, obviously. But it's actually legal to drive without insurance. But the reason the reason it's annoying and, and frustrating is because you're driving along quite happily and some tool crashes into you. They haven't got insurance. You're screwed. That's it. You're knackered. What what can you do? Your insurance will they might cover some of the stuff, but ideally the whole point is that if they hit your car, their insurance covers your expenses. They haven't got insurance, they've gone. You, good luck with that. Your premiums go up. It's thoughtless and it's selfless. I uh, thoughtless and selfish. So I applaud the fact that <laughs> police pull you. Because that's the good thing now. You see it on the, the sort of following police around. They're driving around in the police car. They get a ping on the AMPR. The car in front's got no tax, no insurance, no MOT. They pull it over. That car's getting taken away. I watched one where there was a guy driving it. Some mouth-breathing moron. So like, oh, oh, I'm going to get home. And he was like, you know, 70, he was like, he's from like Birmingham somewhere. And he was in Manchester. And he's like, am I going to get home? Don't care. Your car's coming with us. Bye. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, if you, you for those who aren't in the UK, uh, to drive a car on the road, you must have a valid driving license. Obviously, that's kind of common sense. Or a provisional license if you've not yet taken your test, but you have to be in the, in, in the presence of a qualified driver if you've got a provisional license. Uh, so you have to have a valid driving license, but your car must have insurance. Uh, no exceptions. And it must have valid MOT uh, if you're outside the UK an MOT is basically 
uh, every year you have to take your kind for an MOT test. MOT, ironically, it's Ministry of Transport is what it stands for. So it's a bit like it's like an automatic teller machine, machine, ATM machine. But MOT test, basically, once a year, your car has to go in for inspection and be certified roadworthy and safe to use on the roads. And what you do is you take your car in. I've just done mine uh, on Monday, actually, my car in for its MOT and somehow miraculously passed. You take the car in. The MOT test takes place. The guy goes through your car, checks it, and I mean really check it. Uh, and it will either pass or fail. If it's in good condition uh, and there's nothing really he's doing to it, it will pass. And you're allowed to legally drive it on the road for another 12 months. If it fails for any reason, then you cannot at all legally drive that car anywhere on the road until it then passes an MOT. So if you take your car in for an MOT and the MOT examiner says your car has failed, it needs £700 worth of welding done to the chassis to make it road safe, you have to do that. You cannot. You can drive the car away. Uh, I think the law is you can drive it to somewhere to get the work done or you can drive it home and that is it. Because as soon as they do that test, they then log on the driver and vehicle licensing agents, the DVLA's computers, that your car has failed its MOT. By the time I get home from my MOT, I go onto the DVLA website, my car is listed as passed. Uh, the, you can pass and get advisory. So there can be things wrong with it that they say, well, look, it's passed. I mean, mine's got it this year because I took mine in on Monday and I was terrified. because I was gonna, It's a very old car. It's like in 2002. So I'm like, what's it? And he said, it's actually passed, but there is an advisory. The steering, the steering dampers are a bit, there's a bit of play in the steering dampers. You need to get them sorted out. And I've been, they've been telling me that for years. So I must get it done. Uh, so it's a pass with an advisory, which is, it's not enough to fail the car. It's still road safe, but there's something you need to get looked at. So yeah, you have to have insurance. You have to have a valid license and you have to have a, a valid MOT, which lasts 12 months. If any of those are missing, the police will pull you over fine you potentially uh, take the car away from you potentially uh, and in certain situations they can take the car away and it can be just destroyed you may not get that car back uh, all of the driving without insurance is an offense as is driving without an mot because the mot basically says this car is at this point in time this car is pretty much safe to drive on it's not going to fall apart and kill people it might do six months later, but at the time the examiner tests it, everything is road legal. And and it can be little things that it fails on. You know, it might be that, you know, your headlights are out of alignment. You'd fail the MOT. That's only like a 10, a 20 quid adjustment they can make, but it can be a lot of things it can fail on. We're not just talking like the engine falling out or, you know, if you've got a crack in your windscreen, you can fail your, your MOT. You have to get it fixed. But once you fail it, you have to have those things fixed. And most most situations where you get the MOT done, it's mo most places that do MOT test centers are also garages uh, and repair shops. So most places will do the MOT, they'll fail it, and then they can also do the work for you as well. But you don't have to. You can take it somewhere else. They're not obliged to have it done there. But um, yeah, so... But the amazing, the amusing thing is, and I know I don't know if this is the case now in the US, but I remember a few years ago there was a thing in the US where they were debating whether to bring ANPR, automatic number plate recognition, and there were people like saying, "Oh, this is an infringement of all this, that, and the other." But it's so funny when you actually watch police use ANPR correctly, because literally they are driving along, and the ANPR is in the in the front of the grille of the police car and the bumper or something like that and it's just a little camera and it looks at the license plate <clears throat> on the car in front it then compares that to the not only the police database but also the DVLA the driver and vehicle licensing agency database and it's hilarious because if it's stolen or wanted or if the vehicle is owned by someone who has outstanding warrants or the police want to get hold of them for some reason or other, it will ping them because it will check the uh, the police database. So if you're a criminal and you're wanted by the police, it will, it will look at the license plate 
it will it will say okay there's no, the car isn't wanted for any reason but the license plate belongs to joe bloggs and joe bloggs is wanted by the police for on quite on drugs charges it'll ping him and they'll pull it over uh if the person itself in the car isn't wanted but uh, the DVLA have not been notified that there's a valid MOT or that there's valid insurance because when you insure your car, the insurers have to notify the DVLA. So the DVO, DVLA will know if you're insured or not. Uh, so if it, they'll pick it, and if if DVLA comes back and says there's no tax or there's no insurance, they pull it over. It's I love it. It's great watching it because it's like people's. How did you know? Well, because do you not watch people that don't know why they've got pulled over? And it's like seriously. How can you not be in the 21st century and not understand about AMPR? Do you not watch like police shows? It's hilarious. The excuses they get. I, I have no no patience for people like that. If you want to drive a car, you have to pay for the privilege. You don't. It's not a right. It's a privilege. I know. I know for some people it's an absolute necessity. But you know what? It's not a right. It's a privilege. And if you're going to drive a car on the road. There's a responsibility to make sure the car is actually fit to be on the road. You're not going to put other people at risk by driving something where the wheel is going to fall off and you're going to skid off and kill some kids crossing the road or something like that. So, yeah. <clears throat> oh, well, it's very strict over there, says Lynn Dipple. We have to have insurance also. Don't know what happens if you don't have it. Don't know. Some states have yearly inspections like Texas, but in New Mexico, you don't have to be very scary. I've seen cars that shouldn't be on the road. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about other countries, but I know in the UK it's very, very strict. But I, I think that's for cars. It's a good thing because you want to know that the car that's driving on the road is, is maybe not, you know, it's not going to be safe like it's just come out of the factory. But you want to know that people driving around are driving in cars that aren't about to swerve off because the steering's failed or the, the, the whatever, you know. You want to make sure that people are driving around in safe cars. And not, you know, for their safety and for everybody else's safety. I don't. It's been a real grumpy old man thread today, hasn't it? <laughs> I don't know. It's been a real grumpy old man session today. Bad TV. Young people shouting at clouds. Oh, get off my grass. I don't know. Right, well, that's almost all the yellow armour done. I've got a little bit I need to do with a smaller brush. Do ba do ba do. Do ba do. Always, make, always does amuse me though when you get like mostly when it's some plonker in an expensive car that gets pulled over for no tax and no insurance uh, not no yeah oh yeah there's also i forgot to mention road tax as well in the uk you have to pay road tax so yeah your car has to be insured you have to have a valid mot a certificate say the car is worthy which you do every year you have to pay road tax <clears throat> which is basically a, a a tax that you pay to give you the right to take that vehicle on the road um basically the road tax funds or should fund uh things like you know the highways and maintenance and things like any government-led traffic initiatives things like that are paid for by road tax so you have to pay road tax it has to have valid tax moc and insurance so yeah it's not cheap <clears throat> ian eon's car says you're being a necron fox <laughs> yeah yeah uh so yeah valid tax MOT, and insurance so it's not cheap i can barely afford to run my car i barely afford to run it uh i was terrified on monday because my mot was on monday and i was terrified i i just managed to save up enough money uh to give me a bit of clearance if anything needed to be done to it because last i took it in last year and it needed a little bit of welding to the chassis underneath and underneath somebody wheel and that cost me about 300 quid so yeah, last year was expensive so I put some money aside, I had some money, I was like, right, I've got a little bit of a buffer, as long as it's nothing too major, I'll be coming out Monday afternoon with a car. If it all goes horribly wrong, I won't have a car. Because if it's like, yeah, it costs you 600 quid to fix it, it's not worth it, it's not even worth that much. Um, so I was like, I managed to save some money. But then just before I took it to the garage, before I went and took the car in, I quickly checked my bank balance and forgot um, that the RAC... The Royal Automobile Club uh, had just taken out their yearly payment, and it's the same time as my road tax and the same time as my well, same time as my MOT. So they just taken out their hundred and two hundred quid for the year, and that just wiped me out almost. I'm like, oh. but luckily when I got my car back, they said it's passed. It's just forty five quid for the MOT with an advisory on the steering. I'm like, oh thank God, because I would have been screwed. I would have been totally screwed. Um, yeah, RAC, if you, again, if you're not in the UK, the RAC is breakdown cover. It's a company. There's different companies that do breakdown cover, so you pay a yearly premium. 
And if you break down, they come and recover your car at the roadside or at home or whatever. They do basic repairs or take to a garage. Um, so I forgot about that. And I wish they'd just do it monthly, like a small amount each month, like the road tax, but they don't. They just say, here, we'll have 180 quid now, please, thanks. And it's exactly the same time as my MOT. And I'm like, oh, ass. Right, so that's those bits done. I've not done the shield uh, because that is a bit I'm going to film for the actual proper uh, video series. If you remember, this is a video, this is a Patreon exclusive video build, this is Arby. So although you guys are watching this live stream where I'm just doing some dry brushing and I'll be doing the same kind of live stream when it comes to decals and things like that, where it's just me sitting at the bench for hours and hours and hours and I just need some company. For the actual build series, that is Patreon exclusive. So I'll be showing how to do that properly uh, on the Patreon series. Again, if you want to watch that series, uh, you can do. You just need to make sure you're a $10 plus Patreon subscriber. It's patreon.com forward slash model making guru. The address is down there. Um, the money basically pays my bills. This is what I do for a living. So I depend on my patrons absolutely to keep this channel going. Without my patrons, I wouldn't be able to do any of this. I used to have, obviously, I've, I've used to work. Um, but there's no way I could work full time and do this. Not with my particular life at the moment. It's not something I could do. So it's a godsend that for the past three or four or five maybe years, I've been able to do this as a job because of the absolute fantastic kindness of my patrons who basically made it entirely possible. If all my patrons were to leave me now for whatever reason, uh, I would have to obviously go and you know, find some employment. I'd be down to like maybe a video a month. I mean, I know my, my video output's not been fantastic over the last six months anyway. For various reasons. Um, and when I'm doing a Patreon exclusive build, it's difficult to put stuff up on YouTube because I, don't, I, I can't do like multiple builds at once, which is why I'm doing these really. So that although I'm steeped in this Patreon exclusive build that you guys, if you're not a patron, can't see, so there's not much going on, on YouTube, I'm giving you something on YouTube. You're getting live interactive stuff. So there you go. So yeah, if they all left me now, I'd have to go and get a job and then you might get one video every month. So, and I'd be sad. So I can't thank my patrons enough for helping me pay the bills, keep the lights on, and being lovely, lovely people. Lovely, lovely individuals. They're all awesome. Whether it's a dollar, or a five, or a ten, or a more, whatever they, wherever they decide to, to give me each month it's all massive massive massively appreciated and they're all fantastic <laughs> little bit of dry brushing on this bit here uh, what I was going to do and I totally forgot to do it and I just remembered I've forgotten to do it if that's a real thing if you can remember to forget that you've just forgotten something um, I was going to basically put all the armor I suddenly realized I'm painting all these bits of external armor uh, having them off the inner frame but I kind of realised I don't really want to put the armour on the legs yet. I, I, but I can go ahead and I can actually put the armour on the arms and on the torso and other paces and still be doing this dry brushing and paint chipping. Because uh, on the on the arms and stuff, on the arms and torso, they're small. I can get the armour on and still manoeuvre them round to do the... Uh, the dry brushing and the chipping and everything else. I can't really do that on the legs and I'll show you them in a minute, but I can't do it on the legs or the waist because it's like that tall. I can't really maneuver it around easily enough to be able to paint it properly, especially on camera or even not on camera. Just it'd be a pain trying to manhandle these legs all the time whilst trying to also paint them. So uh, I'm going to leave the armor on the legs off, but on the arms and legs, and I forgot I was going to do that before I started filming today or sure, uh, streaming and I forgot. Now I'm not being too careful with these bits that are these little things here are the insides of the thruster bells. A lot, oh, hey, drop the brush, that'd be a good idea. A lot of the thruster bells have a yellow interior. Some of them are just yellow, all the three, like yellow plastic, but some of them are like two parts. They have the interior and the exterior, and the exterior is grey or whatever, and the interior is yellow. Now I'm not being too careful with these because I am going to put weathering in these and like streaking and stuff a little bit, maybe. So although I'm kind of trying to pick the edge out, the, the sort of ring around the edge, I'm not worrying too much about the inside. Because if you ever have a chance to look at an actual real rocket thruster bell, 
yeah, they're just black. They're just black inside because of all the all the carbon scoring and everything else that comes out. I saw a photograph once and it was amazing. It was uh what was it? it was of a it might be one of the like the Elon Musk's dragon things or something where it come back through the atmosphere. I just heard a very strange noise from downstairs. I'm assuming that Mama Fox is watching some kind of cute animal video or something on YouTube because there's a very strange noise is coming from downstairs. Um, and it was like, it obviously a rocket that had come back through the atmosphere. Uh, or it might have been just something that was launched. I can't remember what it was. It was like a, a small rocket of some sort. Uh, not only was the thruster bell just black on the inside, like just pitch black. Um, the actual, oh, look at that. Oh, ooh, Games Workshop, God damn it. Uh, the actual body of the rocket, like almost halfway up, because people paint like rockets and stuff, like you know, like your your Elon Musk type rockets and your Apollo rockets and stuff, and people paint them and they always look nice and clean. And you think, well, if it's going to have been used, there'll be some there'll be some some dirt on the thruster bell, maybe, and a bit of that where there's some blowback of dust, but it won't be that dirty because there's no dirt in space. Uh, but this thing was. Like the inside of the engine bell was just black, black as the darkest night, uh, and halfway up this, the body of this rocket was just filthy, dirty, covered in. Cr it was like I'd done a heavy spray coat of ammo by Mig uh, streaking grime all over it, and really, really heavily. I'm just going to try and get these painted there. Uh, it was like almost mushroom coloured, about halfway up, and then it faded out to just like the white of the rocket body. And that was, um, it wasn't necessarily re-atmospheric scoring or carbon or anything like that, because it was it was a stage of the rocket that would have separated in atmosphere. So it would have gone up in the air and then fallen back down again. It wouldn't have had really um, any kind of proper atmospheric burn coming back into its atmosphere. So it was really an in-atmosphere stage that was, never left the atmosphere so it didn't get any of that heated up plasma kind of burning but it was filthy just because of all the blast when it takes off and all the crap coming up it was amazing and it really changed the way i look at like painting things like that but it's another one of those situations i mentioned it before where um when you're painting a model of some sort I'm just the, i've just done a massive handbrake turn by the way you may not have noticed uh, when you're painting something uh yes i know lynn says see what happens when you take your glove off yeah i know red lens in hey red lens. evening i am back says pascal welcome pascal welcome back uh, yeah when you're painting something uh assuming you're doing you, you're trying to go for a fairly you know not silly outlandish paint job there's two ways to do it when you're doing any kind of weathering there's realistic weathering and then there's what I call kind of expected weathering. And they don't really meet. There's no real kind of crossover with them here. Uh, and you have to make a choice when you're doing a weathering job, when you're painting a model and you want to give it some kind of weathering of some sort. I mean, there's obviously not realistic weathering because there's like silly borderland stuff, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, realistic weathering is where you will faithfully try and reproduce weathering on a vehicle so if you're building say a world war ii tank corps or something that's a real world vehicle of some sort you know you're probably going to go for some kind of assuming you're doing weathering you're going to stick to some kind of realistic weather i'm going to put more tape on there aren't i because that tape isn't going to work oh hang on i ordered some 3m tape and i got the wrong size i've got the big fat stuff i didn't want the big fat stuff never mind um yeah so you can go for like realistic weathering. If you're making a real world vehicle, it, it probably behooves you to do realistic weathering because you're making something that actually exists that people can look at in real life as a point of reference. And if you make it look not really convincing as a weathering job, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb. So it behooves you, if you're doing a, a realistic thing that exists, you probably want to do a, a, at least a semi-decent weathering job, or at least a weathering job that has some reference to reality. You know, and to do that, you you know, you, you have to think about what's the, the thing made of, how does that thing react to, say, air or water or salt, what kind of environment is the thing in? 
Is it under the water? Is it under sea? Is it on the ocean but above the water? Uh, you know, a U-boat will be a prime example. How do you weather a U-boat? Well, uh, yeah, if you're doing rust, for example, you have to keep in mind that on, say, a U-boat, you're never really going to put any rust underneath the waterline unless it's been in dry dock for a while because when it's under the water metal rusts a lot lot slower underwater because there's less oxygen to to do the reaction it's the iron and the oxygen reacting that causes corrosion above the water of course there's plenty of oxygen because it's above the air so you get a lot of rust above the waterline but below the waterline you tend to get less so things like you think realistically about things like that if you're making something that's completely made up space vehicle a gundam or any kind of anything like that that doesn't actually exist then you've got a lot more freedom you've got kind of a carte blanche you can you can kind of have fun with it you can do whatever you want but then there comes a point where you'll do something weathering and it's like hmm i've done a, a rust coat or i've done uh, a streaking coat or you've done something that is absolutely as you would see it in real life absolutely you've, you've done the research you've looked into how the materials behave in certain in the environment that the model's in and you just look at it and you think it doesn't look right it's not like to scale i don't mean to scale as in the right size it just looks wrong in the same way that if you were to make a model car uh, a shiny sports car and just use automotive paints and automotive lacquers and then polish it up like an actual car it would look kind of out of scale because the shine from real automotive lacquers works on a full-size car but when it's shrunk down to that size it looks a bit you're right your brains go in i know it's just something not quite right so you'd maybe tone down the shine a bit to give it like a scale shine. it's the same kind of principle and that's what i've said before about when i was driving along one day and i saw a load of streaking down the back of a van I've said it before. Imagine back of a, a panel truck with a you know the, the roller blind door on the back, like that. Roller blind door. Here's the truck, there's the wheels down here. Uh, and there was a streak that was there and it went, there's a little rusty thing here, and the streak of rust went like that. It went at a funny angle, it went diagonal. Um, and I'm thinking, that's weird. And clearly the van had been parked at an angle, like that, on a curb or something, and the water had dripped and the rain and the rain and the water streaking down from the rain had just like dripped the rust and dragged the rust completely vertically uh, from top to bottom. Of course it did, because gravity works. But the van's at an angle, so the street goes like that. And then of course when it's driving off, the streak's at an angle. Now in real life, you see that and that's what you think. You think that's been parked at a jaunty angle and the rain has streaked. But if you made a model of that truck and you put that streak on the back and you put this angle, everybody would be like what the hell what's with the what that makes no sense whatsoever and you'd have to kind of then explain it to everybody and they go oh right you say yes at some point in this vehicle's past that i've made it was parked at an angle and then the rain street and you just you so there's some there's some times when you can go realistic and i can't remember why i'm talking about this now but sometimes you've got to between realistic actual weathering like i could put that streak on there but i'd just be causing problems for myself because nobody would understand why it's there uh, or you think okay Let's just tone that down. Let's just go for what people... And this is why I say the kind of expected weathering. It's what people expect to see. I can't remember why I was talking about this. Um, so I'll just kind of say... There was probably a point to all that. And I don't know why I was talking about it. Oh yes, engine scoring and thruster bells and stuff. So yeah, when you're doing any kind of weathering... Have a think about the sub, the vehicle or the whatever you're making. Think about its environment it's in. And then think, what would it look like in real life? And is that going to translate to a model? Or is it just going to be asking a million questions? Um, sometimes it's better just to take the realism but not get so specific like the funky streak or you know anything like that just just go for what people and sometimes it just it looks better in scale a, a small miniature version it's kind of a weird way of explaining it i can't remember why i was explaining that um uh, but daniel smith says i must remember these weathering tips for my tank build part one if you don't know what that is i was explaining last time about like how to properly use youtube to your own benefit so you know titles tags and text there is a video on my uh there's a channel on my video called fox explaining things and one of them is how to do tutorial videos on youtube if you're doing any kind of youtube go and watch the video it explains how to how to, to be a good youtuber and one of the things is like titles text and tags i won't explain it all again but yes my tank build part one <laughs> Yes, I'm glad. Thanks for the callback there, Daniel. 
extolling the virtues of people that put uh, the frustrations of people that put videos up with like no useful information that will never come up on search. My tech, my plane bill part two, the second episode. Please watch like and subscribe. Uh, I know people that have put videos up and set up YouTube channels and they come and they're like, I never get any views. Nobody ever watches my stuff. Why can't I get subscribers? And the videos are all like, uh, just like model making part four. Brilliant. Who's how are you going to get found in a search? It's, oh, it makes me laugh sometimes. Uh, some people do think they can just make a video, put it on YouTube and the entire internet will come and watch it. No, you have to put a bit of work in. You have to do your titles, text and tags. and Oh, it's, it gets a bit more, a bit more complicated. Uh, quick look at chat. Uh, I normally use blue tack to keep my parts in place when painting, says the Hitman, Neo, uh, Hitman Neo even. I do as well. Um, for these parts, though, these were spray painted with a rattle can of... No, they weren't. Yes, they were. Some of them. I'll start again. For, for these parts, they're too small to put on clampy sticks. Uh, like these things, the little clampy sticks. For most parts, I'll use those. Uh, they're kind of too small to put on that. And these were all airbrushed and rattle canned as well. So when I'm doing any kind of rattle canning outside or airbrushing, I've got lots of little tiny parts. And they've all got a certain edge that I'm not going to have to paint. Like the inside of these panels, you're never going to see. So I can leave them unpainted. Uh, the edges of these little thruster areas, you're never going to see the edge that's on the tape. So they're just never going to be need to be painted. For that, I could just get, this is just some normal adhesive tape. This is 3M body tape. Fold it over into a loop, stick it down. I can plonk them all on and then I can airbrush them, rattle can them. There you go. Uh, the, the beauty of this is I'm not then spending ages picking little bits of blue tack out of pieces because you end up with, again, it's things on sticks. Or I mean, I've got a big... That's a big chunk of blue tack on a placemat, an old placemat. And the reason it's black is because I had something on there that was then primed black. The base for my, um, it's the base that I'm going to use for my uh, Funko Pop Space Marine. Because that was like, there you go, go and paint it. It takes two seconds. But I've got lots of little parts. So I'll put them on tape just because then I've got them all there. And I can get them all primed and painted and do the rattle cans and the airbrush. It's just easier than having little farty things on sticks. Uh, but only really works if there is an edge that you don't need to paint. So if I was doing the inside of these panels, for example, this wouldn't really work because I'd have to turn them over and then, yeah. So uh, these little light, these beam sabers here, I'm only you're only going to see the very end, so I'm not really too fussed about under there. So there you go. Uh, average modeler says um, that almost killed me. My tank build comment got me laughing hard. My coworkers are looking at me like I've lost my mind. <laughs> my tank build part four. Please like and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching. Just some people are so special when it comes to that. They really do think, some people do think you can put a YouTube video up and it'll just, the entire internet will just flock to watch it. It's like, no, you have to you have to make people aware it exists. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I am super grateful for all my subscribers and all the people that watch my stuff. Ridiculously grateful. I mean, I'm almost at 22,000 subscribers now. Um, one day I might get to 100,000 and get me a little silver play button. You never, I doubt it. I doubt it. Uh, but I'm not in it. I'm not really in it for that anyway. But but and I was very lucky that when I started out, <clears throat> I'm going to make a rod from my own back here. But yes, I had X number of subscribers, a small number. And then I started that big Diagostini Millennium Falcon. And suddenly I gained like five or six thousand subscribers. <clears throat> and then I kind of stopped the build. But hey, uh, and that kind of gave me a boost. But not everybody's lucky enough to have that. I was lucky that that came along and it gave me the kick. And then as soon as you get into a few thousand subscribers, it kind of goes from there. But when people are starting out, if you are starting out and you weren't watching the last show when I explained all this, just very, very quickly, you can't just put a video up and expect the entire internet to come and watch it. And suddenly to get to like, you know, five, 10, 15,000, whatever subscribers overnight. Lots and lots of channels will just sit at a few subscribers or a few hundred subscribers and just very, very slowly work the work. But you have to promote your stuff. And it doesn't necessarily mean, <clears throat> you know, that you have to have a swanky video, a swanky website or anything like that. Although having a website helps. But I'll tell you, I've got a website and the views on my website are so low. I don't update it very often, but I don't get a lot of traffic from that. And I, I could just stop having the website altogether and just get rid of it. It wouldn't really make any difference. You have to get people aware that you have a channel so if you are trying to do youtube <coughs> either just for fun oh dad's off thanks for coming in dad uh, take care buddy uh, i won't be on in half an hour i'll be having me chinese food in half an hour but thank you for coming in there dad 
I really appreciate it, especially if you're, if you're sitting with E. So thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you can't just plonk a video up and expect it to work. You've got to really build your, your followers up. <clears throat> and what that means is, uh, you know, aside from the obvious stuff like try and give regular content, you don't have to. And it, it does help. I mean, obviously, I've not been great regular for the last year or so, but I've had real life stuff to deal with and family stuff and things like that. But uh, it's more about, first of all, build up a community. So don't just do a YouTube channel. If you're doing whatever you're doing, it could be gaming, it could be this kind of stuff, it could be, I don't know, whatever you want to do your YouTube channel about. Don't just do a YouTube channel and hope people find it. Get a Facebook page going. If you can, if it's something you can set up a group about, like I did with the Model Makers Boom, set up a group. Uh, although with model making stuff now, everybody's doing that, so that probably won't really do anything anyway. Um, you know, have other venues and other things where other people can find you. But the most important thing is when you're doing a video, give it a title that explains. Just think whenever you're doing a video and you put a video on YouTube, think especially about this. How are people going to find it? There's only two reasons people watch model making videos. One, well, three reasons. One, they like the person that's doing it and it doesn't matter what they're doing, they watch them anyway. Like, you know, Duncan and Peachy and things like that. Two, they want to know about the specific thing you're building. They might want to know, is this kit any good? They might want to watch somebody else build it because they're going to try and build it. They want to see what you, how you get around things. Or three, uh, they might want to know how you do a specific thing. They want to learn how to do a specific thing like airbrushing or, you know, ink outlining or I don't know whatever the glazing or something they either want to learn something they want to find out about the thing you're building or they might just like to watch your stuff at first you're not going to have that they like to watch your stuff they're not going to have you're not going to have that because you haven't got the followers built up so you have to count on they want to know what you're making and they want to know about the thing you're building or they want to know how to build it or whatever you do they want to teach to learn how to do it and that's why you have to make sure the title of your video the description in the description box of your video and all the tags use the kind of words that people would search for in the YouTube search box. If I, if I, the example I've used is, you know, if you, somebody wants to build, I said the other day, look at a Sherman fight. I'm a new builder. I've not made many models. Uh, I want, I've just bought a Tamiya 135th uh, Sherman Firefly kit. My first ever model. Brilliant. What do I do? I'll go on YouTube. Um, Sherman, Tamiya Sherman Firefly, how do I make it? Or whatever they put in the search window, they're going to search for Tamiya, they're going to search for 135th Firefly Sherman, they're going to search for all those things. And like I joked before, if your video is just called My Third, My, My Tank Bill Part One, and your description says, Please like and subscribe, thank you very much, uh, and the tags, there's no tags, then they might type in Tamiya 135th Sherman Build or Guide or Painting Guide or something, and none of those words are going to be on your title or your text or your tags. They're never going to see your video. Your video will never, unless somebody search for searches for my first tank bill part one or something like that. They're never going to find it. So that's why you need to make sure your title, your descriptive text and your tags all have as many searchable terms in them as possible. Obviously, the descriptive text needs to obviously be some kind of description as well. Say, hey, everybody, welcome to this bill where I'm painting the Tamiya 135th Sherman Firefly in the um, Battle of the Bulge paint scheme from 1944 to 1945. And it's going to have this, this and you, you do lots of things in there. But the tags have to be things that people are going to search for. The, the description, the title all need to have searchable things. That's how you appear on YouTube. That's how you get people to see your stuff. And once you get enough videos on there and the people start seeing your stuff, assuming they don't hate it, that's when you get the third part of that little tripod, which is people watch your stuff because they like to watch you. They like what you do. They might not be watching because of the kit you're building or the what you're doing. They might just like to sort of see your stuff. So that's why. So if you just have my tank build part one and nothing else, you're never going to go anywhere. Never going to go anywhere. So there you go. So that's that's what in a nutshell. I probably won't go over it again because I've done it twice now. Uh, YouTube don't really like small channels these days. They have realised the profits are in mega corporate channels. True, they do try and they do try and help them out a bit though, because you know the, the small channels do grow. And you'd be surprised some of the the crap that I've seen that have massive viewer uh, subscriber counts. Some of it's insane. Uh, Captain Nemo, welcome, Captain Nemo says. Think what you would type in to search when naming a video exactly. Uh, or the see some mud munching funny stuff in an emperor's skit. Wait, Quanaman says, or okay, uh, or the see some mud munching funny stuff in an imperial skitter vid and have to have more, more, more. That's true. Yes, I did actually. 
yeah, if you saw that, you probably would have thought, I'm going to watch more of this guy's nonsense. I was ready for it that time, says Average Modeler. Yeah. My orange juice is not orange juice. Thank you very much. No, can't drink that. Can't drink that now. If you'll drink this, you will be sad. Thank you. Please like and subscribe. Yeah, I don't know where that voice comes from. <laughs> I don't know where that voice comes from. It's kind of my stupid people voice. Uh, right. So, yeah. So, basically, whatever you're doing, if it's on YouTube, just even if you're just doing, even if it's not YouTube, even if it's just a website or whatever you're doing, just put in as much information. If you're, Here's the thing for you. If you're a member of the Boom Hut, which I will now hang on. Give me one second. Just in case you're watching and you're not, if you are a member of my Facebook model making community, which is the Model Makers Boom Hut on Facebook, uh, lovely, lovely place. Anyone can join, dead friendly. One thing that gets me sometimes is that people will put up uh, a link to something, and it might, might be a link to content on their page, which is fine. You know, we like people to pimp their stuff, or a link to a video. Uh, and one thing that gets me is, if you look at whenever I put up a link to something on my Facebook page or a, a YouTube video that I've done, something where I'm, you know, pimping around stuff, I'll always put a description. I'll say, hey guys, here's the latest episode of Sudda Dada, go and watch this, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a link to the YouTube video or the content on my page. And even if it's a post on my Facebook page that I'm then linking into the Boom Hut and it's got a description, I'll still put, hey guys, go and take a look at this. And then the number of times people put in like a post and it's just, they've just put in the URL for a YouTube video or their Facebook post or whatever it is. And there's no description. It's not encouraging people to click on it. If 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 I see a post with a with a, a YouTube uh, title page, the thumbnail, uh, and perhaps the thumbnail doesn't tell me what's in the video, I'm not going to press play. I'm going to be like, eh, next, because I don't know what it's about. It's always about getting people's attention. If you're posting something up in a group, like Boom Hut, for example, and you're reposting from somewhere else, like you're posting a YouTube video or you're posting, well, I think a YouTube video has the title, but say you're reposting a post from somewhere else on Facebook, like from your page, instead of posting something up in your page and then just linking to that in Boom Hut, why not link to the post in the Boom Hut, but also put a bit of a description? Because you rather than just count on the description that's on the post in the page you're copying it from, because some, sometimes on mobile, you don't see that. So you just get, you know, you might just get a, a blank post with some photographs and you'd be like, oh, okay. So always, always put as much information, talk to the person as if they're there sat next to you. You want to get their attention. You're always, we're all fighting each other for people's attention in a very polite and friendly way. So yeah, don't, don't skimp on giving information out. Don't do shortcuts. Anyway, Fox is possessed by the spirit of Johnny Vegas. Oh no, not Johnny Vegas. Oh, boy. No. This is this is my Johnny Vegas boy. It's not really <laughs> my first tank. <laughs> I don't know. This is my dad device. It makes me not spill things. Thank you. Goodbye. I like that voice. I have to do that voice more. I don't know. Anyway, yes. Uh, so yeah, don't don't hold back when you're posting stuff. You want to if you want to get people to see your stuff, you have to make people aware of it. So don't 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 fall back on those things. But anyway. We've repeated myself now from what we said last time. Uh, we're going to leave it there because it's 10 to 6. Uh, I need to go and order some noms. I need to order my um, wonton soup, shumai and Japanese beef udon. <gasps> All going to go into my mouth. And I can go nom, 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 nom and have fatness. And then tomorrow I'll be sad because I'm fat. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so we're going to do that. But thank you very much for watching. Don't forget, of course, tomorrow... If you are in the UK and you are able to get to Stoke, uh, Chris, Ted and I and also Tony uh, are going to be going to emodels.co.uk, my channel sponsors uh, in Stoke. Look them up on the interwebs for their address. If you're able to get there tomorrow, I know it's a work day for some people. Sorry. It's the only day we could all make it. So do come along. I'm going to get there probably, I don't know, we'll kind of all get there about lunchtime-ish. So assume to be there from, say, midday onwards. Um, do come along if you can. Uh, if you are coming along, uh, then remember if you got if you want to pick some stuff up while you're there, you don't have to turn up on the day and say, "Can I get?" Because remember, it's a working warehouse, not an actual shop, so um, you can't walk around the shelves and have a look. So if you if there's anything you want to pick up while you're there, go online after the show now. Go on to eModels website, fill your basket full of goodness that you need to get, put the order through, but put in when you come to payment, put that you'll pay in store and put a note saying, "I'll pay in store tomorrow." Uh, and then they'll just get it all boxed up for you, and then you'll come in the store, you give them some money, and they'll give you a box full of stuff. So if you need to pick anything up, get it, get an order put through tonight, 
uh, ready for you so then you can just go and give them lots of money tomorrow uh, there will be cake and donuts, but you might not get anywhere near any of those cake and donuts because uh, Dad's bringing donuts. Dad's coming, uh, but we'll eat all the donuts. So there you go. Uh, so yeah, if you can come along, uh, do come along. Uh, Osric asks if Tony has finished the helicopter. He is working on the helicopter. I think he has actually finished it. He's just not had time to finish editing the videos. He's moving house and family stuff and lots of other things. He's just that's why you've not seen him for a long time because he's just he's been out of the loop. He's been really out of the loop. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Lynn says, like I said, my SL71 is in the shop or I would be there. Yeah, have you not got a teleporter? So you can teleportations. It would press the button. Hello, I'm in the shop now. <laughs> yeah, that'd be that'd be fun, that. Teleporter. Uh, do, do, do. It's not 10 to 6. It's 10.57 a.m. in New Mexico. It's also probably like a billion degrees. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, so do come along if you're able to. I know not everybody can, but if you can, come along, come along. Uh, I've, I've, I wash my car especially, and by saying wash my car because it's kind of rat rod paint job, I clean the windows. I, I did some, and, and even then because it's a rat rod, I kind of did a half ass window cleaning job. So I kind of half ass clean the windows. That's it. That's what you need. Bit of glass cleaner, Psst, rat rod clean. There you go. So yeah, do come along. Uh, I will probably do another one of these on Friday if I get a chance. I've still got a lot. I've got all. This is the yellow armor. I've still got one more coat to do. I've got to do the uh, phalanx yellow. If I could just stop dropping it, that'd be great. Uh, not even dawn yellow. Phalanx yellow. I've got to do that yet on all the yellow armor, which is what we've got done so far. So I've got the dawn yellow. And then even then, there's still all the red armor. So I've not even touched the red armor yet. And there's lots more of that. So I've got loads of this to do. So I'll, I'll try and do another one of these on Friday. Uh, Saturday, I'll take a day off. And then Sunday, back. I'm back with Warhammer Sunday. Of course, Monday then is the next e-model show. So, uh, if I don't see you tomorrow, uh, I'll probably see you back here on Friday's Day uh, for more of this nonsense. Fox, your side chat window crashed. Yeah, it refreshes itself every now and then. I, I see a blip on my screen. It kind of resets. I don't know why. Streamlabs, what can you do? Uh, but yes, uh, how am I doing for drop frames? Maybe I dropped a frame or something. My connection fell over. It's probably Mama. It's probably you know what it is. It's probably just like Mama Fox watching horse videos or something on on the iPad, uh, and it makes things fall over. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But yes. So if I don't see you tomorrow, I will see you probably on Friday. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, and then throughout the rest of the week next week. But until then, I shall say thank you very much for watching. Do take care of yourselves. Remember to go and check out yourmodels.co.uk for all your model making needs, and check out Goblin Gaming. The link in the description below this video for all your tabletop gaming and model making needs. Remember, you save twenty percent off Games Workshop, Conflict Forty Seven, and Malifaux with them, and massive savings on everything else. And if you use that link, I make a little bit of income. So do go and check that out as well but until next time take care of yourselves go make something awesome go be awesome and i shall say adios i hadn't i hadn't finished it for some reason i've got a new mouse and some reason it seems to sometimes think things have been pressed when they've not right so i shall say go make something awesome go be awesome one day i'll do this and not screw it up and until next time adios amoebas Bye now, my first end titles part one. Bye.